at and I urge Adam Ingram and others to continue to make the representations. Many thanks. My abject apologies to members whose questions I haven't been able to call. We have to now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14252 in the name of John Swinney on Scotland's future, democracy and devolution. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Deputy First Minister, if and when you are ready, uh, you have 14 minutes to speak to the subject and move the motion, please. Officer, I welcome the opportunity of this constitutional debate one year on from the referendum on Scotland's independence that took place on the 18th of September 2014. It is clear that the referendum has had a profound and positive effect on our nation and on our democracy. We have seen a level of informed and engaged debate that has reinvigorated politics in Scotland and evolved people old and young alike across our country as part of that debate. It is worth recalling that over 3,600,000 people turned uh, out last year and cast their vote, a turnout of over 85% higher than in any other election before. The result may not have been what I wanted, but we must celebrate the democratic engagement in the process that took place. And there has been a real legacy from the referendum into the bargain. The turnout in the recent general election was 71% in Scotland, compared to 66% across the United Kingdom as a whole and an increased turnout on previous United Kingdom general elections. 80% of people in Scotland have discussed politics since the referendum compared to 67% for the United Kingdom. So the real engagement, the reinvigorated politics continues, as does the close interest of, people, of the people of Scotland in how we are governed and who makes decisions and who decides who makes decisions within Scotland. The first and critical test that we face in honouring this democratic renewal is fulfilling the undertakings that were made during the referendum campaign by those opposed to independence and who were successful in the referendum to strengthen the powers of this parliament. Today, it is exactly one year since the vow was made on the front page of the Daily Record. On the 16th of September, the Prime Minister, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg jointly promised extensive new powers for the Scottish Parliament. The vow also said that people want to see change, and no vote will deliver faster, safer and better change than separation. This was not the first promise of further devolution made during the campaign. Danny Alexander said Scotland will have more powers over its finances, more responsibility for raising taxation and more control for parts of the welfare system, effective home rule. The Prime Minister said the status quo is gone, this campaign has swept it away there is no going back to the way things were. A vote for no means real change. He also said that if Scotland says it does want to stay inside the United Kingdom, then all of the options of devolution are there and are possible. And Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, talked of nothing less than a modern form of Scottish Home Rule and said that we're going to be, within a year or two, as close to a federal state as you can be in a country where one nation is 85% of the population. On the back of those undertakings, with the legitimate expectation of proposals which could be accurately described as a form of home rule or near federalism, eh, my party and myself and every other party in Parliament took part in the Smith Commission set up by the United Kingdom Government. Now, we in the Scottish Government had some misgivings. In particular, we had misgivings about the process. Political parties trying to reach an agreement in a room seemed about as far away from the participative, open, engaged democracy of the referendum campaign as it was possible to get. But we accepted and respected the outcome of the referendum, and so both my party and the Scottish Government played a full and constructive role in the Smith process. We made no secret of our view that the final recommendations of the Smith Commission did not go far enough. Nor do we believe that the Smith Commission proposals met the undertakings of the UK parties which set it up in the first place. Yeah, of course. Alex Johnson. The Minister has been speaking for nearly four minutes now, and I would interpret his argument as being that he signed up to the Smith Commission reluctantly, and he would still like to hark back to the discussions that took place at the end of the referendum campaign. Can the Minister tell me uh, today if it is his ambition to see the full implementation of the Smith Commission, or if he wishes to centre his argument at a previous point on the timeline? Well, I, 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 John in the course of my comments, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer directly the point that Mr Johnson has made. But you know, I, I, I don't think 
anything, any conclusion that Mr Johnson could arrive at of anything that I have said or done since the publication of the Smith Commission proposals in November last year has given any intention that, that could be misinterpreted that I want to see the full implementation of the Smith Commission proposals. My problem, and this is what I'll come on to discuss with Parliament in the course of my remarks this afternoon, is I think we're away, away from the full implementation of the Smith Commission proposals as they were set out last November. So in reflecting on the Smith Commission, a settlement that leaves under Westminster control over 70% of tax receipts in Scotland or 86% of welfare spending in Scotland cannot be remotely described as home rule or near federalism. But my judgment was that the proposals, if the UK government implemented them in full, and I'll come on to that in a moment, offered enough enhancements of Parliament's powers to allow us to support the final report. I'll give it to Mr. Gavin Brown. Just briefly, why does he only ever refer to a percentage of welfare spending instead of percentage of spending, like most commentators would do? Well, I, I, well the, the, the reference to welfare spending is, uh, is, is, a, is a, a very clearly expressed argument about welfare spending. In terms of total spending, of course, the Smith Commission does not give us more than 50% over, uh, control over total spending in terms of the revenue raised. So, um, and, and, and these, these points are, are well, well charted by what the Scottish Government has said in the past. Uh, and then to, to come to the issue that Mr Johnson raised with me about the implementation of the Smith Commission, uh, the, if we reflect on the efforts of the United Kingdom Government since the publication of the Smith Commission, it is clear that it, uh, the, the current approach does not implement the recommendations of the Smith Commission in full, not in spirit and not in substance. Last week, the architect of the vow himself, Gordon Brown, described the UK government as falling short on the delivery of the recommendations of the Smith Commission on Scottish devolution. In May, the unanimous report of the Cross-Party Devolution for the Powers Committee, supported in this chamber, provided the authoritative analysis of the UK government's draft clauses. Their overall conclusion was that in some critical areas, the then UK government's clauses fall short of the Smith recommendations. In considering the actual bill that was introduced in May, the committee found only one clause had been changed to reflect the committee's findings. Twelve were completely unchanged, and a further eight had been changed, but in a way that left it unclear whether the committee's findings had been reflected or not. These included clauses on key areas of social security, employment programmes, the Crown Estate borrowing and the Sewell Convention. This position is a considerable disappointment to the Scottish Government. Now, the, the, so in answering Mr Johnson's point, and I think this is one of the material points in the debate today, we are at a point where it is clear, despite having the information, the submissions of the Devolution for the Powers Committee and also of the Scottish Government, and then also the reflections of what I think we would all describe to be one of the key players in the outcome of the referendum, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, who I would readily accept was a fundamental player in the conclusion of the, uh, of the referendum campaign and in the success of the No campaign by the promise that was made. Mr Brown is now telling uh, parliamentary uh, committees that the UK Government is falling short on the delivery of the recommendations of the Smith Commission on Scottish devolution. Now that, that, that is a point that I think Parliament has to take very seriously. I'll give away to Mr McDonald. Lewis, I'm Mr. grateful to, to Mr Sorry for taking the intervention. He correctly describes the conclusions of the Devolution for the Powers Committee and, and I, I accept the points that he makes. I was a member of the committee uh, at the time. Does he accept though that that is not, should not be conflated with the commitment that was given by Ed Miliband and other party leaders for extensive new powers which are in the Scotland Act, albeit they may not be all the powers that we, we might desire? I think the person in danger of conflating something is Mr Macdonald, in fact. The point I'm making is that uh, at absolutely face value, judged by the Devolution for the Powers Committee, which I, you know, is an all-party committee, so I think pretty neutral, um, the Scottish Government, who I accept are, we're not neutral, but I think we've approached this in an utterly dispassionate fashion. And then, well, well on, on this question, we most definitely have... And Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister is saying that the Scotland Bill does not deliver on the commitments made in the Smith Commission. So that, to me, is crystal clear evidence that the United Kingdom Government has got to move and move significantly in the course of the passage of the Bill that remains 
at the House of, in the House of Commons. And the, the, that is, of course, the stage to which we will be turning shortly, where the, uh, the UK bill, the Scotland bill, will be returning to the report stage in the House of Commons. And we know clearly the areas in which the bill needs to be improved. The restrictive definitions on carer and disability, the absence of new powers to create benefits in areas of devolved responsibility, the restrictions on the length of employment support programmes that can be delivered and on the type of people that can be offered help, clarity on the Crown Estate provisions and the future economic assets like Fort Canaird, a provision that protects this Parliament's interests by including clearly the, the full scope of the Seoul Convention, including its need for the Parliament's consent to changes to its own competence and that of Scottish Ministers, respecting the spirit of devolution by removing vetoes for UK ministers in crucial areas of universal credit and energy schemes. And these issues are amongst the issues that require to be addressed when report stage is reached in the House of Commons. So I invite Parliament to join me in urging the Secretary of State to engage closely with the Scottish Government to produce amendments that we've already suggested to the UK Government that accurately reflect the Smith Commission report and have the support of both governments. So we know that the, the powers in the, of the bill fall short of both the vow and the recommendations of the Smith Commission, and that we will continue to demand that those promises are delivered. At the same time, the Scottish Government is acting with pace and with creativity to be ready to use the limited powers that are proposed, and we will do so in consultation with others. In the programme for government, we set out some early policy priorities, a Social Security Bill in the first year of the new Parliament to give effect to our new Social Security powers, the abolition of the bedroom tax as soon as is possible when we have the powers to do so, improving support for people to move into employment through reform of the work programme and work choice, improving access to priority business and tourism markets by reducing air passenger duty by 50% from 2018, and early action on gender balance on public boards, the abolition of fees for employment tribunals, and the management of the assets of the Crown Estate in Scotland to maximise benefit to the Scottish economy and to local communities. So these are some of the early priorities of the Scottish Government to take forward the utilisation of the powers that will come to us as a consequence of the passage of the Scotland Bill. Now, I also want to say, Presiding Officer, a few words about the fiscal framework that will govern financial relationships between the governments in the future. The fiscal framework must give the Scottish Government the flexibility it needs to create a fair and prosperous Scotland and to use the powers we have in an effective way. We know that this must be done in a responsible and a sustainable matter, uh, manner, as we have always used our own fiscal powers as we have them. In my evidence to the Finance Committee inquiry, I have set out some of the key elements that we need to see in the fiscal framework. Block grant adjustments for devolved taxes that reflect receipts at the point of transfer, based on an agreed methodology and data. Transfers for Social Security that reflect the full cost of the benefits devolved. Changes to the block grant that reflect the full cost of administering the new powers and the ability to increase the amount of capital spending materially through capital borrowing powers. Most fundamentally, we need a well-designed fiscal framework that ensures further devolution provides the right incentives and increases accountability, linking the Scottish Government's budget to Scottish economic performance. We should retain the rewards of our success as we will bear the risks. When the Scottish economy outperforms that of the rest of the UK, our spending power should increase. So it is absolutely essential that the fiscal framework provides the Scottish Government with genuine flexibility and choice to pursue our own distinct policies. The framework will be agreed jointly by both governments and we are aiming to conclude negotiations by the autumn. And I'm currently involved in discussions with the Treasury in this respect. But I want to make it clear to Parliament, as I've said to the Finance Committee before, the Scottish Government will not recommend that this Parliament gives consent to the Bill without an agreed fiscal framework that is fair to Scotland. I would have no hesitation to refuse to recommend a proposal that did not provide us with the ability to use our powers properly and flexibly to support the people of Scotland, to address our own priorities and to improve our economy. Presiding officer, I want to bring my remarks to a close by reflecting on what the Scotland Bill tells us about the condition of democracy in Scotland today. The driving force for what became the Smith Commission process was the clear momentum for change generated during the referendum campaign. But since then, we have seen a return to business as usual, illustrating graphically the mismatch between democracy and devolution in this country. The Smith Commission was, in the end, a party-driven exercise 
The people were given little say in its process and none in its conclusions. In that process, we missed, we missed many opportunities, perhaps because of the lack of public pressure in a closed process. So the Scottish Government proposed, with the support of the STUC, full devolution of employment law. This was not supported in the Smith Commission, with the consequences that we have seen in the Trade Union Bill this week. The Scottish Government, with the support of many stakeholders across Scottish society, proposed that social protection be devolved in full. Again, this was not supported by other parties, and the consequences can be seen in the cuts to welfare that have been driven through Whitehall today. Presiding officer, what this demonstrates is that this Parliament must be equipped with the powers and the responsibilities to enable us to take decisions that meet the expectations, the needs, the priorities and the choices of the people of Scotland. And that is what the Scottish Government will argue for. I move the motion to my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 14252.2. Ten minutes, please. Tight for time today, Ms Baker. Okay, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in the week of one year anniversary of the referendum, it is understandable that a lot of today's focus will be reflected on that historic day last year. Uh, many column inches have already been filled this week, and I'm sure more words will be written about it before the week is out. Um, it's also understandable that many people today may wish to reflect on their personal experiences. Uh, the vote on the 18th of September was a truly remarkable day in Scotland's history, and a day that will live long in everyone's memory. But, presiding officer, today it is important that we use this opportunity to look forward. Last year, the voice of the majority of Scotland was clear, and it, we all need to accept that result. It was to stay as part of the United Kingdom, but it was also clear was that people wanted politics and democracy to change. Um, the Smith Commission, and from that the Scotland Bill, are to be one of the vehicles to deliver that change, though I caution it is not the only one. That change will be achieved if we, politicians from across all the parties, have a change in the way we think about politics and how it is delivered. As, as our amendment states, devolution is not about concentrating powers in the Scottish Parliament. It must be about empowering our communities and our local authorities. Um, I like the title of this debate, which promises more than the motion, democracy and devolution. This is not just about securing new powers, but also about how we use those new powers. Labour's amendment highlights the work programme as an example of the way in which we can use new responsibilities to gain more effective results. Labour believes that local communities and organisations are best placed to deliver this programme, and we would encourage the Scottish Government to look at this way of delivering. Similarly, we must push for the extension of the powers for the Crown Estate, and these powers should then be maximised to make local decision-making meaningful. Um, in giving evidence to the Devolution for Their Powers Committee, Dave Moxham of the SGEC said, It is not enough for Parliament to have a relationship with existing civil or society organisations and then think that it's done its job. That links in with the idea that we and others have raised about citizens' duties and of other ways of creating a representative democracy. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the referendum was a great example of civic participation and we should not miss the opportunities to use the Scotland Bill to build on that. But let me be clear, as things stand at the moment, the Scotland Bill in its current format doesn't meet our expectations. It needs to be stronger, it needs to be more reflective of the agreement from the Smith Commission. That it isn't is disappointing and something I hope the Conservatives will address in their speeches today. And while I do agree with much of their amendment, it does glide over the reasonable concerns that are about the Scotland Act that we have before us. We did have cross-party consensus on the Devolution for Their Powers Committee. So as a result, we are left with two options. One is to continually complain about the bill, undermining what has been achieved, or more constructively, we could propose changes that we could not just enact the Smith Commission in full, but possibly go further. Um, Presiding officer, I want to make the opportunity in today's debate to make it clear that Labour is committed to ensuring this parliament becomes one of the strongest devolved legislatures in the world. We want to see new powers delivered and we will do all we can to make that happen. We have a record of bringing powers to this Parliament when we believe it is in the best interest of the Scottish people. And like others in this chamber, we have no interest in seeing the Scotland Bill fail. We want to take this opportunity to reflect a modern, devolved Parliament, which I believe the Cross-Party Smith Commission set out the blueprint for. To make that progress, though, we need to return to the consensus that was built around the Smith Commission. Um, I welcome the statement from John Swinney earlier today that the Parliament should be united on this. 
That will take effort from all sides, particularly the two governments. One which almost immediately began talking down the document they had signed up to, and the other which has seemingly closed shop and has refused so far to accept amendments from other parties. It is time to put those agendas aside and to work together. If we truly want to see the Scotland Bill succeed, then we need to strengthen the Bill. Um, I hope the Conservative members in the Chamber today will join us and will lobby their counterparts in Westminster in either House to ensure reasonable and proportionate amendments are accepted when the Bill returns to the House of Commons following the conference recess. Um, today the Labour Party has unveiled new amendments to the Scotland Bill. These amendments would devolve a further £5 billion of revenues, along with extended powers over welfare to design a new social security system for Scotland. MSPs would be in greater control than ever in making us responsible for raising money that we are to spend. This includes measures to devolve... Uh, briefly. Mark MacDonald. I, I, I note the call today from the Labour Party around assignment of full VAT rather than partial assignment. Would the member accept, firstly, that that isn't necessarily a revenue-raising power because it would be an assignment rather than a power, but also can she advise whether the Labour Party's view is that that should be based on production or consumption, because that's an important distinction. Claire Baker. Um, I would anticipate that, that um, intervention from the member, having seen Stuart Hosey lining it up for the MSPs this afternoon. Uh, the SNP will know that the um, tax varying powers around uh, VAT is restricted by the EU. However, what this would do, we believe, is give more powers to this Parliament and more control over money that we have to spend. Yeah. Um, this would include measures that devolves all revenue from VAT. Currently, that's set at 50%. This would include all revenue. And it would ensure that this Parliament can top up welfare benefits benefits, give the Scottish power powers to create any new benefits and remove any veto of the UK Government. These are substantial changes. We can build a better, stronger, more progressive Scotland and I hope that when these amendments come before Parliament they will gain the support of the SNP, the Liberals and the Conservatives. It is clear that we need to move beyond any doubt on the issue of Westminster maintaining a veto over this Parliament with regard to welfare powers. This is unacceptable and something that we have moved to stop. The UK Government needs to respond more fully than they have done so far to the work of the devolved Further Powers Committee and to the concerns being raised by organisations about the effectiveness of the Bill. President Officer, we must ensure that there is full transparency as we move forward, and this is as true for the Scottish Government as it is for the UK Government. We are seeing, or rather not seeing, intergovernmental discussions with regard to the Joint Exchequer Committee, a committee of which the Deputy First Minister is co-chair. Um, on the 4th of September, the GEC met for its second meeting, yet no minutes of either meeting have been made public and there's been no clear statement from the Scottish Government of a preferred outcome. Considering that discussions centre on the substantive elements of the fiscal framework that will underpin the financial provisions of the Scotland Bill, the very fiscal framework the Deputy First Minister references in his amendment, it's unfortunate that fuller details have not been forthcoming. Now, I do appreciate that at certain points of these meetings there will be a need for a sensitivity and there will need to be space for frank exchanges. But considering that all within this chamber subscribe to the notion of transparency and accountability, will the Cabinet Secretary take the opportunity today to commit to publishing the minutes of the meetings and to keep Parliament and, most importantly, people informed throughout negotiations? And I see in the letter that Bruce Cawford sent to David Mundell this week that these are principles that the committee support. The stakes that are being set by the Scottish Government are high. The First Minister has expressed the view that she will only recommend consenting the Bill if the accompanying fiscal framework is also fair to Scotland. And in coverage of today's debate, the Deputy First Minister has reiterated this claim. If the Government are prepared to put all that can be gained at risk, there needs to be greater transparency, scrutiny and accountability of these decisions. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm grateful to... Clare Baker for giving way. I wonder if uh, Clare Baker would just clarify the position the Labour Party takes on the question of the fiscal framework. Does she think I should sign up to a fiscal framework that she does not believe to be fair to Scotland? Clare Baker. Well, of course not, but we have no involvement in the negotiations. What I'm asking for is greater transparency, accountability. What we have to rally at the minute is the, first, the Deputy First Minister's interpretation of whether that is fair for Scotland. And uh, we are caught between your interpretation of what it is and what the Conservatives' interpretation of what it is. What I'm arguing is that everyone should be involved in that. That should be transparent and we should be able to make a proper judgment. Um, this is an important issue. I'm sorry, I'm really short for time now. This is an important issue that the Scottish Government claim may lead to the rejection of powers. The public have to be aware of the negotiations 
negotiations as they proceed and be able to make a judgment. Otherwise, we risk finding ourselves in the very scenario that Professor Jim Gallagher warns against, where the fiscal framework becomes a private agreement between two governments. And as the Deputy First Minister will be aware, my colleague Ian Murray has written to ask that the papers published reflect, amongst other things, the readjustment of the Scottish Government's block grant in relation to the new tax and spending powers, as well as setting out the discussions that are around fiscal scrutiny and the current rules of the fiscal, Scottish Fiscal Commission. I hope that in his closing remarks, the Cabinet Secretary will take the opportunity to confirm that he will seek to publish these meetings to the Finance Committee, as has been the procedure previously. Decisions of such importance to the people of Scotland should not be made behind closed doors. President officer, I suspect if you were to ask a family at a food bank what their major concern was, it won't be the constitution. And if you were to ask a patient at A&E waiting for treatment or a bed what his major concern was, it wouldn't be the constitution. If you asked a single parent who's struggling to find a place at college but can't afford childcare anyway what her major concern is, it won't be the constitution. And looking to the future, we have the opportunity to use the engagement the referendum brought to the people of Scotland to deliver change about how we do politics, not just in Scotland, but throughout the UK. Um, the Labour Party has listened to voters, we've listened to our members, and we have a bold, fresh and exciting new leadership that we'll be pursuing a radical new agenda for Scotland and the UK. Excitement in Scottish politics shouldn't constitute itself just around the constitution. It should be about changing communities, embracing opportunities and changing futures. That is why the devolution settlement that we pursue and achieve won't stop at Holyrood. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Annabel Goldie to speak to and to move amendment 14252.1. Ms Goldie, six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I am delighted to take part in this debate and I am stimulated and encouraged by the Scottish Government's chosen title for the debate, Scotland's Future, Democracy and Devolution. Because if the Scotland Bill is about anything, it is about our future. A future confirmed by the democratic decision of voters last September to reject independence, to stay within the United Kingdom and to give more powers to this Parliament. Now, as someone who believes Scotland benefits from the partnership of the United Kingdom but recognised the need for enhanced powers for this Parliament, I was delighted to serve in the Smith Commission with Mr Swinney and others from across the parties and to achieve the united position reflected by the Smith Agreement. Now, over the years, it has been a genuine pleasure to work with Mr Swinney, whether on the Enterprise Committee under his convenership or engaging with him in his important ministerial roles in government. So I acknowledge and respect his undoubted commitment to this Parliament and his wider service to Scotland. I was therefore wounded, Deputy Presiding Officer, wounded that on publication of the Smith Agreement, Mr Swinney appeared to have been seized by an onslaught of simultaneous amnesia, fickleness and inconstancy. Never did I think him capable of such frailties. Suddenly this, suddenly this much discussed, carefully crafted and painstakingly drafted document dissembled in Mr Swinney's midst. It wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't brave enough. Well, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think the Smith Agreement was a pivotal contribution to devolution and historic in its own right. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm, I'm grateful to Ms Goldie for giving way, and I'm glad that she was able to um, set out those words very carefully. I thought she was in danger of... Uh, accusing me of something else, um, with, uh, <laughs> as she expressed them. But can I just say to Ms. Goldie, she, she, would, she, she shouldn't have been that surprised by my reaction to the Smith Commission, given that she, she had to put up with listening to what I was saying within the Smith Commission for a full 10 weeks, in which I was arguing for more, greater powers, wider responsibilities than what was secured in the Smith Commission report. Annabel Goldie. As ever, an adroit and gallant attempt to try and exculpate himself. But in fairness to Mr Swinney, Deputy Presiding Officer, of course I understand from the perspective of the SNP, the Smith Commission does not bring forward proposals for independence for Scotland. But that was never the job of the Smith Commission. The referendum endorsed enhanced evolution and rejected independence. And that's why I've put down the amendment in my name, to put into context the referendum result, the Smith Agreement, the draft clauses and the Scotland Bill. 
And the Scotland Bill is an extremely important piece of legislation. And it is entirely right that it be scrutinised at Westminster and by a committee of this Parliament. And in response to the initial tech from uh, Mr. Uh, Swinney and his SNP colleagues that the Scotland Bill reflects some faint-hearted pilu alley attempt to deliver a minimal extension of powers, can I just remind the Chamber that Spice produced a fascinating analysis of the Smith Agreement proposals? The Scottish Parliament will have more tax and spending powers than the majority of states in federal countries such as Australia, Germany and the United States. And in a league of subnational legislators across the world, Scotland will be near the top. Now, I appreciate that the SNP wanted to devolve responsibility for a whole range of issues like employment law, national insurance contributions and the minimum wage. But a whole range of bodies from very different perspectives, such as the CBI, the STUC and the TUC, had profound concerns. So these matters do not form part of the Smith Agreement of the Scotland Bill. I want to just make progress, if you'll forgive me. Now, in response to the more detailed analysis of the Scotland Bill by the Devolution Further Powers Committee, the committee was principally concerned, I think, about four primary issues, the permanency of the Scottish Parliament, the Sewell Convention, the welfare provisions and the Crown Estates. The statutory recognition in the Bill of this Parliament being considered permanent, together with the obvious cross-party sentiment that the Scottish Parliament is permanent, means the political reality is the permanency of the Scottish Parliament. And I think to pretend otherwise is to dance on the head of a pin. And on the Sewell Convention, this has operated effectively and flexibly as a principle by practice and a convention. But as is so often the case with constitutional rules and protocols, uh, it would be wrong, in my opinion, to try and introduce into the Scotland Bill the process of legislative consent. That was not something the Smith Agreement recommended, and in my opinion, it was right not to recommend that. Now, on welfare, which I accept is a very sensitive issue, I would argue the provisions, which have been extensively altered from the draft clauses, reflect the Smith Agreement. And if there are constructive suggestions to clarify or improve on the welfare provisions, then let us see the detail. On the Crown Estate, this was always rec recognised as technically complex, and I'm sure Mr Swinney and I can agree that within the Smith Commission, this was seen as particularly challenging. The Crown Estate involves the body itself, the UK Government and the Scottish Government, all of whom will require to cooperate and agree on the new arrangements. And the Bill is the enabling legislation for that to happen. Deputy Presiding Officer, let's be clear. This Bill does what it says in the tin. It's a major extension of powers to this Parliament in acting what all parties signed up to in the Smith Agreement. Should we close our minds to improving the Bill? No, but we first must identify what changes are proposed and then be satisfied that they are improvements. And the Secretary of State for Scotland has indicated changes will be made at the report stage of the Bill and has expressly stated he will reflect on opposition amendments. Deputy Presiding Officer, the real debate in Scotland has now moved beyond the Constitution. We cannot be hogtied and pulled back by the separatists to a question answered a year ago, and we cannot get bogged down in the separatists' never end them because their efforts to stay stuck in the past are pulling Scotland down and holding Scotland back. And instead of remaining divided over the Constitution, we should be united about forging a new Scotland. And that's the big question for the Scottish Government. How do we use the powers we've got and the ones we will get to give Scotland an exciting, stable future in an increasingly uncertain and competitive world? We can rise to that challenge, but only by looking forward, not by looking back. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Ms. Golding. I look forward to checking the spelling of Piliwali in the official report. We now turn to the open debate. We are just about where we should be with debate timing, so I'd be grateful if members could stick to their six minutes, please. Bruce Crawford, to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Like many others this week, I've been reflecting on the events of the independence referendum, a decision which, in the immediate aftermath, left me utterly crushed. Yet, strangely, a year later, I now find myself almost celebrating that historic occasion. Perhaps that's something to do with the fact that I'm a card-carrying member of the Tartan Army and that's allowed me to find some joy in glorious defeat. <laughs> However, the referendum was also a remarkable democratic process, as John Swinney said earlier, that led to Scotland becoming a different, a better place. A Scotland with the most extraordinarily engaged people, where the bar of expectations and what Scotland can achieve or is capable of has now been raised to hitherto unforeseen heights. 
So in that context, and the now infamous vow suggesting home rule, as others have said, and near federalism, and the Smith Commission recommendations that we debate today. Now, I don't want to re-rehearse what many individuals and organisations have said about Smith process being too rushed, or that they contained a lack of significant additional powers. I sincerely hope the UK government will respond to these calls, but now we have a Scotland bill before us entering the UK Parliament that will soon be entering its report stage. We must therefore do all we can to persuade a Tory government to implement Smith in full and to deal with the positive criticisms laid out in the Further Devolution uh, Powers Committee constructive letter sent to David Mundell on Monday of this week. That is why I strongly believe that when we come to decision time that we should all support the Scottish Government's motion. Speaking with one voice will provide this Parliament with its best opportunity of seeing Smith Bill get as close as possible to delivering Smith in full, ensuring there is absolute clarity of intent and ironing out any potential dangers. For those that argue that the Bill in its current state does indeed deliver Smith in full, as the Prime Minister was doing today at, for, at Prime Minister's questions, they know perfectly well it does not. To pretend otherwise is doing this Parliament, and indeed more importantly the people of Scotland, a disservice. The very reasonable letter that was sent to the Secretary of State earlier this week, out, this week outlines in considerable detail, as John Swinney already alluded to, the scale of the job that remains to be done by the UK Government. And for my part today, I want to concentrate on three key aspects in particular. First, firstly, I believe there is at the very least a potential for dispute over whether this Parliament will have the competence to create new benefits in devolved areas. There is a significant body of evidence that argues that Parliament will only be able to create new benefits in a much narrower area. This is because the legislative mechanism used in the Bill devolves responsibility for certain specific benefits through a series of new ex exceptions to the existing reservations of the 1998 Scotland Act. Therefore, if a new benefit is not provided for on the Bill, it is argued it will remain explicitly reserved with no exception. This could have the effect, perhaps unintended, of limiting the policy flexibility of a future Scottish Parliament. However, it is abundantly clear from the Smith report it placed no such limitations, simply stating the Scottish Parliament will have new powers to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility. As Professor Eileen McCarg said in her compelling evidence, it would be prudent to put the matter beyond doubt through the inclusion of an express provision in the Bill we should ask the UK Government to do just that. Secondly, in regard to the issue of risk and reward balance, many have argued, including Professor David Bell, that the limited basket of tax raising powers in the Bill may not produce sufficient tax receipts to increase in proportion with future liabilities, such as an ageing population. It is therefore imperative that the fiscal framework agreed between the two governments deals with the specific detail of how such matters will be balanced out in terms of future funding settlements. I say this because I simply cannot see any circumstances where this Parliament can safely agree to any bill unless these matters are appropriately and transparently addressed in the fiscal framework. In conclusion, I want to dance on the head of a pin on the matter of permanency of this Parliament. We all know the difficulty in this area in that, in theory, Parliament, no Parliament can bind in law its successors, and any rule suggesting a particular institution as permanent constitutional fixture can never be guaranteed. Therefore, whatever provisions are finally agreed in the Bill, they are likely to be largely symbolic. I accept that, but I, for one, believe strongly that symbolism and a statement of intent are hugely important as far as this institution is concerned. The Scottish Parliament was brought into being through the consent of the people in a referendum. Surely it goes without saying that it can only be disestablished with the consent of the Scottish people voting in a referendum. Yeah. Such a provision must find itself into, into the Act. Yes, indeed, highly symbolic, but nevertheless a statement of intent recognising the sovereignty of the Scottish people, which I believe 
all in this Parliament are signed up to that concept. So it's up to us to make sure that we can put as much pressure as possible on the UK Government in the coming weeks to bring forward the appropriate amendments to make sure that the bill is de that the Smith Commission proposals are delivered in full in the areas I've outlined and in the areas that the Further Devolution Committee have outlined in a wider context. And I recommend the Government's motion to everyone that we should come behind that at the end of the day to make sure we can get this job done. Thank you very much. And I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Tavish um, Scott. Officer, I agree with what Claire Baker said about uh, decentralised uh, powers, but uh, today I want to focus on the immediate issue of the Scotland Bill, and I hope that the whole Parliament will unite in supporting the Government motion today. I think everybody here uh, supports uh, the Smith Agreement. Clearly, the SNP want to go a lot further. I myself would like to see Smith Plus, but surely nobody in this Parliament wants to see Smith Minus. Now, starting with Social Security, there are several uh, concerns around unnecessary detail and definition, which I'll come on to in a moment, but there are three fundamental problems apart from that. Firstly, the Bill is silent about the power to create new benefits in devolved areas, and that issue must be addressed. Secondly, uh, there's the issue of uh, top-up uh, powers. The Bill should be amended to place it beyond doubt that top-up payments create new Scottish entitlements and are not discretionary in the sense that the social fund is, and that is not uh, clear in the bill at present. And thirdly, we have to get rid of the veto, or perhaps some would call it a perceived veto, in relation to uh, social security. This parliament should be informing uh, the UK government about its decisions on social security, not seeking approval from that government. And that embodies what is in reality now uh, the shared competence between this and the UK parliament on social security. Um, now, moving on to the unnecessary detail and definition, what could be described as the, the micromanagement uh, by the UK government of devolved social security powers. And there are concerns around the word definition of disability in the bill, uh, what's said about carers, what's said about employability programmes, and also discretionary housing payments. Andrew Tickell, who gave evidence to the Further Powers Committee last week, said some of these issues were likely to lead to litigation. For example, the bill says significant disability. What does significant mean in a court of law? He also posed the question, what interest does the Westminster government have in defining carers' benefit as being payable only to people over the age of 16 who are not in work uh, and not in education? Why does the UK government have to uh, narrow down the definition uh, of carers in that way? There's also concerns about the employment uh, programmes and about the, the, the fact that they're restricted to a particular type of person who's been employed for a particular length of time. There ought to be far more freedom there as well. And again, I agree uh, with Claire Baker about the implementation of those at a local uh, level. And a final example of this micromanagement around discretionary housing payments, where again the person, it is said, has to be in receipt of housing benefit and not being sanctioned. Uh, and, and again, that is a const constraining the freedom of this to par Parliament on an area that we were said to be uh, getting autonomy in relation uh, to. Sorry, that's rather a clumsy sentence. Moving on to the Sewell issues, my former ministerial colleague, Lord Sewell. Now, um, there are two issues here. I think the first uh, issue is the wording of the bill, which says um, the UK Parliament, I think this is quoting, will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters. I don't think we like the word normally, although I wouldn't die in a ditch over that, I suppose, because there could well be emergency situations. But it still sends out the wrong message. Devolved matters is slightly odd because that wording is never used in the Scotland Bill, but that is a bit of a techie detail which I shall uh, move on from. More substantively, uh, our current arrangements on uh, legislative consent or so motions are governed by Devolution Guidance Note 10, and that doesn't just talk about legislation in devolved matters, but also talks about this Parliament giving consent to, and I quote, anything which alters the legislative confident, competence or the executive competence of the Scottish ministers. And there's nothing in that about, uh, 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 nothing in relation to those words in the current bill. And that's very serious because it means that this Parliament, for example, would have no uh, locus in terms of dis discussing 
that Scotland built, uh, because obviously it's, 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 it's altering our legislative competence. And the same would be true if the executive competence of ministers we, was being changed either positively or negatively. Moving on to equality issues, there is no equ clarity uh, on equality issues. Again, the words in the bill, again, I think I quote accurately, except to the extent the provision is made in the Equality Act 2006 or the Equality Act 2010, means that the proposals in terms of quotas are all going to be governed by those acts where there's no clarity whatsoever about quotas. So I think what needs to happen in terms of the Scotland Act is given the commitment of David Mundell to quotas in a letter, uh, he, he ought to make sure that in the bill it is explicitly stated that Scotland should have the ability to legislate for quotas, including those for 50% of women in elections to the Scottish Parliament, public bodies and local authorities. Finally, VAT, Labour's put forward a proposal on that today. I mean, I totally agree with what the Cabinet Secretary said, that the budget should be related to economic performance. And I think, albeit it's in a side tax, that having VAT in that way does enable this Parliament to uh, reap the benefits of uh, improved economic performance. But again, that ought to be explicitly stated. I don't know whether the VAT issue is going to be in the bill or just in the fiscal uh, framework. Now, again, I do agree that the fiscal framework is absolutely fundamental, and I agree that we should not consent to the bill if we don't have a fair fiscal framework, because the whole future of devolution hangs on a fair fiscal framework. If we can't get the block grant adjustment right, uh, for example, crucially, then uh, devolution will fail because we'll end up worse off than we are at present. So it's absolutely central. I agree, obviously, about increased capital spend as well. So all those issues, but I also agree with Claire Baker, all of it has to be transparent and there has to be full discussion of that. So I think um, the fiscal framework is central uh, to this, uh, but I, th I hope we can, as I said earlier, unite around uh, the government's motion. Uh, obviously, we come from different positions, but I think we can all unite around the words of that motion. Many thanks, and I now call Tavish Scott to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, when uh, Malcolm Chisholm said there were two issues with Lord Sewell, I must say I thought he handled that issue very delicately indeed. Uh, and uh, I had forgotten that the Deputy First Minister reminded us that uh, we were ten weeks in that hot room uh, sweating over something, and that just does not seem to be loved, so I don't quite know where I'll ever get that time back again. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Government's motion does appear a straightforward endorsement of the Devolution Committee's work on the current Scotland Bill. So I've been a little bit surprised that the SNP have appeared to have wanted to use such an endorsement as a trigger to veto the bill in interviews that have been taking place on radio this week, and indeed a condition for a second independence referendum. I'm puzzled that, by that because Mr Swinney's government threatened the 2012 Scotland Act with a veto, but ultimately, of course, the government accepted more powers that that bill uh, devolved. So I can't see the circumstances where uh, the Scottish National Government, uh, sorry, the uh, National Government here in Edinburgh would veto more powers this Parliament. I do totally accept the Deputy First Minister's point, uh, I'll give away, on the fiscal framework. That is a separate matter, but I struggle to imagine circumstances where uh, this Parliament will not gain by having more powers. Have you Deputy wait? First Minister. Can, can I, I'm grateful to Mr Scott. And can, I, can I help him in this analysis by pointing out to him that what convinced the Scottish Government to support a legislative consent motion on the Scotland Bill 2012 was the fact that the UK Government changed the mechanism for block grant adjustment to the Holton mechanism, which was then acceptable to the Scottish Government, because that proposed by Calman would have been damaging to the fiscal interests of Scotland. Sure, and that, I, I accept that point, and, uh, and that's why I make the point about the fiscal framework. But my wider point is about the powers this Parliament can gain that other members have uh, talked to in the context of this debate. But I wanted, to, to, I wanted to enter into the constitutional spirit of this debate in this week of all weeks. After all, Labour do have a new leader, a genuine socialist. Uh, politics is black and white again, and certainly not Blair. Uh, Neil Finlay is now the most influential Labour politician in Scotland with the ear of the leader. So I wanted to make a constitutional suggestion to Team Corbyn. Um, Team Corbyn may be a concept that takes Labour unity a little far, judging by what we've been watching. But Labour should go back to the future, as they did in the past, and embrace devolution within England, because I believe that's important for Scotland as well. I fear that will not happen because command and control socialism does not sit easily with decentralisation. I doubt, therefore, that policy shift towards the obvious and only alternative 
to the constitutional morass of the UK, and that is a federal country where the nations of England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland figure out a coherent way of working together. That's why I believe the intergovernmental work that the Devolution Committee is doing is arguably the most important part of the work that's taking place at the moment. A federal system creates uh, a positive, unifying future for Scotland and for the rest of the UK. It's completely normal across the world for modern, complex democracies such as ours. It would be good for Scotland, and it is a pity we cannot ask Parliament to support it with a vote on my uh, amendment this afternoon. Now, I doubt that nationalist friends here will embrace that progressive approach uh, of a federal UK, not in Scotland anyway, but certainly in Wales and in Northern Ireland, where nationalist parties do recognise and indeed openly articulate that future because they see the interdependence of uh, their countries, their nations, but also the benefits that can flow. Now, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned last year's referendum. It would be a surprise were that not to have been raised this afternoon. I now read that Angela Constance and Richard Lockhead are leading lights of the campaign for a second referendum, yes, too. Now, I have to gently say to my friends on those benches that most of us generally did think when people say once in a lifetime they absolutely meant that. So I think for many Scots, uh, suggesting we should go down the same route as we went down last year will be a considerable ask indeed. Rather, the politics of today uh, will be about the SNP's short-term political positioning uh, on a judgment of how left-wing to be, because Jeremy Corbyn's success in becoming Labour's leader, Labour leader and indeed his socialism can bring lost voters back to Labour. Ms Sturgeon, I suspect, will not want to lose West Central Scotland back to the old enemy, so Scotland can expect a battle on who is more left-wing, and that matters in terms of what we are to look at over the Constitution and the future. It also leaves the centre and the right of both British and Scottish politics. The Tories, um, in my view, move ever more to the right. Uh, a vindictive trade union bill, a trade union bill that not even Mrs Thatcher would have brought forward to uh, the UK Parliament. It's actually also just bad politics because far from dividing Labour, it seems to have completely united them. So I don't think that has worked. But the issue that's every bit as important for our constitution in Scotland uh, as for um, our future is actually Europe. And we are about to witness, as, I, as we have all seen in the past, a Tory civil war. I heard Bill Cash on the radio the other morning and I thought, indeed, back to the future. Now, that matters because the European question is one SNP condition for the second referendum on Scottish independence. The SNP have said that they would not work with other pro-European parties to face down the arguments for leaving Europe. Now, I think that's disappointing, but possibly hardly surprising. After all, just as the First Minister of Scotland wanted David Cameron to win in May, so she wants England to vote to leave the EU, because that helps the SNP, it helps the SNP, and it helps the case for Scottish independence. All that makes the liberal and radical progressive centre of politics essential. It is the gaping political hole and a great opportunity, not just in the UK, but in Scotland too. And I say it openly to my party, it's why the Liberal Democrats will recover from the trauma of the last five years. It's increasingly clear that there are only two future courses for Scotland, independence or federalism, and that federalism is the only viable future for the UK. Scotland is well placed to provide the drive and the route map forward for that new future, a federal UK with a stable and lasting written constitution that honours, honours the democratic decision of the people of Scotland last year. Now is the time for that new start. It is a time for a federal UK, and it is time to find people who want a lasting progressive settlement for our nation amidst other nations. Thank you. I've been quite generous with the first three speakers, but I must now ask everyone to try and keep to their six minutes, please. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Drew Smith. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would, the only thing I would say in relation to... Tavish Scott's remarks is that I certainly never used the phrase once in a lifetime, mainly because I hope that I'm going to have quite a long lifetime yet. But um, beyond that, I think that it's important that we look at the, the, the genesis of, of today's debate and, and where we've got to. And I think I found it interesting that Lewis MacDonald said that we shouldn't judge the, the vow on the basis of what's in the Scotland Bill. Well, if we are to take the the, the sort of progression from the vow giving birth to the Smith Commission and the Smith Commission 
giving birth to the Scotland Bill, we could argue that perhaps a longer gestation period would have been more beneficial. Uh, I don't think you can uh, rub out those, those very clear lines between those different processes. Uh, and indeed, today, the UK government, as, as my colleague Bruce Crawford has said, are again asserting that they are delivering uh, on their promises to Scotland. I think that most objective analyses of what is before the Westminster Parliament would tend to disagree with that. Uh, and I note the comments from both the, the Tories and Labour about Scotland being uh, one of the most powerful subnational legislatures. And I would, I would point to the, the graph on page 26 of the unanimously agreed uh, Devolution Committee report, which demonstrates that around 38% of the taxes raised in Scotland will be either devolved or assigned to Scotland. Comparatively, uh, Basque and Navarre is over 50%, uh, Quebec over 70%, and the other Canadian provinces over 60%. So I think that, that bears comparison when we're making those kinds of statements. In terms, in ter I want to make some progress on the issues that I want to, to highlight. In terms of uh, the issues that have been highlighted uh, through the discussions and deliberations uh, on the two committees that I sit on, both finance and devolution and further powers. In terms of taxation, there's a question around both the completeness in terms of the taxation elements and also the, the suite of taxes and the basket of taxes that are being devolved. And I note that uh, while we are to receive powers over income tax uh, to this Parliament, there will not be the powers over national insurance contributions, which would strike me as being something that would provide some completeness in that element. And also, although uh, we're not being given powers over the personal allowance, we are apparently going to be in a position where a zero rate could be set, which seems to me to be a bit of a faff when essentially that is a, a, an instrument through which personal allowance alterations can take place, except for the fact that um, a zero rate is uh, applicable if Scotland wishes to increase the personal allowance element beyond that which exists at Westminster. If Westminster takes a decision to increase the personal allowance uh, in and of itself, that will have an impact on the tax income for this Parliament, and it will be interesting to see how that issue will be resolved should that decision be taken, because obviously it would have a material impact on the projections of the Scottish Government in terms of the income that would be available to it. In uh, the other issue uh, around this is around the issue of dividend income. And I note, for example, ICAS saying that if a decision were taken in this Parliament that resulted in uh, individuals moving income into dividends, it would reduce the tax income for this Parliament but boost the tax income for the UK, Parliament, UK exchequer because they would see the benefit off of the dividend income. Again, that is an issue which I think is going to need to be examined, particularly how that would relate in terms of no detriment. In terms of the breadth of options available, um, both the Royal Society of Edinburgh said that uh, they felt that the, the taxes being devolved were a narrower basket of taxes than is usually the case, uh, and the Chartered Institute of Housing said that while the Scottish Government may appear to have the power to make changes to the social security system, they would lack sufficient fiscal levers to put changes into practice. I think these are comments which are worth uh, noting. In terms of VAT, I note the Labour call for full assignment. Uh, I would qu caution the Labour Party on saying it will result in additional revenue because it will result in a block grant adjustment, that assignment. So it will simply be an offset. It won't be additional revenue over and above what Scotland would receive. Absolutely. But that's why the point I made about production versus consumption is important. Because if it's attached to production, then there is an incentive in terms of boosting economic activity in Scotland because we would then see the benefits off the back of that production. Attachment to consumption does not necessarily carry that same incentive. So if we want to see, as, as the Labour Party suggests, benefits through economic activity, then the attachment to production is perhaps the way that that should be pursued. In terms of the issues around borrowing in the fiscal framework, presiding officer, these are, 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 are critical elements. I think what we need to see is some detail around what exactly the borrowing powers are going to entail. There has been talk that the borrowing powers will replace what is currently in place in, in this Parliament, in which case there is a question around how effective those borrowing powers can then be if they are replacing rather than supplementing what this Parliament has available to it. But there's a wider consideration here <coughs> as well. The Secretary of State for Scotland came before the Devolution Further Powers Committee on the 25th of June of this year. And when he was asked about the flexibility for this Parliament within the fiscal framework, he said, it is not the intention that the fiscal framework should constrain the powers that are being devolved in the bill. However, 
Paragraph 2.2.5 of the command paper from the UK Government states, in the context of Scottish devolution, the fiscal framework must ensure that Scotland contributes proportionally to the overall fiscal consolidation pursued by the UK Government. Those two statements, presiding officer, do not tally with one another. Either this Parliament will have flexibility, and there, there's a knock-on effect there in terms of the definition points around uh, uh, welfare, which I know some of my colleagues are going to speak about a little bit later, around flexibility. But either this Parliament will be given flexibility, which is what devolution should entail, or it will be constrained. And that will be the acid test of whether or not the fiscal framework matches the aspirations that were outlined in the vow the Smith Commission and are expected by the Scottish people. Thank you. And I now call Drew Smith to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Um, like John Swinney, I think the country is in reflective uh, uh, mood, even as uh, we here are concerned with the detail of the legislative uh, provisions uh, which will deliver the conclusions of the Smith Agreement. Um, I, mean, I think he was right to say that last year's referendum was uh, an exciting time uh, for all of us. I think the jury is out on whether or not uh, that unprecedented engagement with politics uh, will be sustained into other issues and ideals, but we can certainly uh, hope and, and uh, 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 be active that it does. Um, on one level, I, I think uh, Annabel Goldie was right to highlight this. The, referendum, the result was a vote of confidence in devolution uh, as a process, as a way of doing things, which I think at its very best does represent uh, a partnership with our closest neighbours, respecting the principles of good government, uh, which is closer to people and based upon uh, sound rationales for where power should lie, uh, and crucially the routes that we all have to achieve uh, the changes that we each believe in. However, it, it was never going to be an endorsement of the status quo, either in regards to the powers of the Scottish Parliament versus uh, local government, as Claire Baker highlighted, or uh, versus powers at the UK level. And uh, Neither, thankfully, could it be uh, an endorsement in terms of the current order of who holds power, because uh, who holds power and wealth, and indeed then the most opportunity in our society. Because these are the big questions of modern Scottish politics, just as they uh, have, all, ha have been throughout the last century. They're constitutional, yes, but they're also fundamental. And I think uh, for Labour, these remain who has power and whose interests do they wield it, and how is it obtained by those that it, that it excludes. And the test to be applied to the Scotland Bill is firstly then how does it match up to the commitments made last year? Is it consistent with how Scotland voted in the referendum? For Labour, the Smith uh, Agreement went beyond proposals we'd made as a, a party beforehand. For the SNP, it, it fell short of their demands. And that, I suppose, in the end is as it should be because the majority of Scots chose union over independence. But the purpose of the, the Scotland Bill is to give effect to the agreement that was reached. And so for Labour, just as, actually uh, as for the SNP, uh, the bill as currently drafted is not quite there. Um, I would certainly pay tribute to Ian Murray uh, in his role as Shadow Secretary of State uh, for the work that he has done uh, in pushing amendments uh, to the bill beyond uh, uh, the position from which we started, uh, beyond the position from which my party started and beyond uh, the position that the UK Government have taken us to. And equally, I would commend uh, the cross-party work of the Devolution Committee here. Um, of the Scottish Government itself. Uh, and I think also we need to respect the fact that the SNP's victory in the general election gives them uh, a duty to ensure delivery of that agreement uh, and more generally to, to articulate the desire of their supporters to go, to go further, uh, either than the... the con sure. Bruce Crawford. Can I say to Drew Smith that, first of all, you know, I, 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 I welcome some of the stuff that Ian Murray has been done. I welcome the idea around full assignment of VAT. But would he accept, as was described by Pracer, McLean last week, one of the architects of the Cameron Commission, uh, our committee, that VAT, um, where we, we could assign, not devolve the whole of VAT re receipts in Scotland to the Scottish Government, it would not make a blind bit of difference to the policy levers that the Parliament can pull, because all it will mean is a reduction in the block grant at the end of the day. Drew Smith. Well, I, I, th I think that takes us back to, to, to why the, 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 the fiscal framework to all of this is, is, is so important, and I, th I think we'd, we've, we've argued that we, that we do accept uh, the Deputy First Minister's argument around the importance of the, the fiscal framework, provided uh, there is some transparency about it and not just um, that the Scottish Government don't like it and therefore we should all uh, uh, reject it. I think, um, though, you know, in the current environment, I think consensus is a worthy aim uh, in what we're, we're trying to achieve, particularly uh, in constitutional politics, but it shouldn't be the be all and end because we all uh, uh, reserve the right to argue our own 
uh, positions, even when we're, when, in, we're, when we're in the minority, uh, as people who supported independence were after the referendum and as my uh, party found itself after the general election. But I think uh, you know, we have to face up to the fact that within uh, our devolution debate, that, or within Scot the Scottish political debate, the constitution itself uh, is a contested issue. And that does present uh, a significant challenge, uh, not to just to those of us who supported the result last year, but actually I think um, to all of us involved in Scottish politics. And that might not be the ch a challenge that the SNP particularly feel uh, just now, but it is a challenge uh, for all of us because constitutional arrangements basically are they're just simply rules which govern uh, power. And since power is always uh, capable of being challenged, um, you know, I suppose true consensus is never uh, going to be possible, but it should always be sought. Um, you know, like uh, 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 others have said, you know, I enjoyed last year's referendum experience and I enjoyed some of the debates we had uh, in here in advance of that. And for the most part, it was good natured uh, and respectful. But I think, uh, you know, we, ha we will all have, um, you know, friends, family members uh, uh, or, or people simply just that we respect who reached a different conclusion uh, on the independence issue, issue from ourselves. And that's really the same issue uh, to me in the Scotland Bill. We need to get beyond, I think, some of the cynicism uh, around this process, which I think has damaged it uh, uh, to some extent. I think on one side, we've got cynicism about what can be achieved and then uh, a degree of disinterest from others in achieving the most uh, consensual consensus possible. And that's what troubles me, uh, presiding officer, about this. Because Scotland didn't just provide an opinion uh, about powers for the parliament or constitutional status. It provided an instruction. And therefore, the challenge facing us is to, is to deliver upon what was promised, yes, and what was instructed. Uh, uh, but also being, uh, 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 you know, and from my side, that's about the greatest possible de degree of devolution uh, that is not to our detriment. But we also need to be respectful of the views and aspirations. Uh, of the minority. And I suppose thinking about the, the last year, because I know I'm aware I, I, I should close, um, you know, we could have had an opportunity throughout all of this to build a new framework for devolution, which respects the outcome of the vote, delivers on the promises that was made and commands as much support as possible. And I, I regret that we don't appear um, to have reached that. And all I would say in closing, presiding officer, is, you know, glorious de defeat uh, to, to Bruce Crawford. You know, there may be lessons in that. There may be attractions to it, you know, not least uh, on this side of the House, but I really hope we arrive at a better resting place um, the, than glorious defeat. And I hope the UK Government do move from uh, the current position, give support to some of the amendments that they're talking about, and I'm happy to support both the Labour Amendment and indeed thank the Thank you very much. Linda tonight. Fabiani, to be followed by Anne McTaggart, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I want to start with uh, direct reference to Clause 17 um, of the report of the Smith Commission under the introduction of the Heads of Agreement. It says quite clearly... Uh, the parties believe that Scotland's devolution settlement should be durable but responsive to the changing needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland within the UK. As a result, it may be appropriate to devolve further powers beyond those set out in the heads of agreement, where doing so would aid the implementation of the consensus reached by the parties in this report. That is so important. It reflects the speed at which the Commission was obliged to work, following the Prime Minister's announcement in 19 September last year and the timescale. It reflects the spirit of the Smith Agreement beyond the substance. and It sets out a starting point for additional powers, a floor rather than a ceiling, in the interests of cohesion. Uh, from the Commission discussions, I have no reason to doubt that although there were many disagreements on powers to be devolved, there was consensus on the fact that powers should make sense and be cohesive. The order of reporting and the resultant Smith document reflects that desire for cohesion. If you look at the heads of agreement, again, pillar two, delivering prosperity, a healthy economy, jobs and social justice. This chapter combines welfare, employment, equalities, social affairs. It's a cohesive approach with points of agreement for further discussion. A floor, not a ceiling. However, here we are with a draft Scotland bill that doesn't even reflect the floor, the starting point. That's confirmed by the Cross-Party Devolution Committee in its reporting, and it's confirmed by witnesses giving evidence, academics, practitioners, neutral commentators. These draft clauses don't open the starting gate, uh, or the clauses don't open the starting gate, let alone move along that track to cohesion. Pillar 2 calls for devolution of all employment support services currently provided by DWP. Uh, the bill... Uh, includes a restriction that support must last for at least a year, a significant limitation. 
Pillar 2 called for creation of new benefits in devolved areas and flexibility and universal credit. The bill gives no explicit power. There are restrictive definitions in relation to carers, and there is still a veto clause on universal credit. On the equalities issue, the Devolution Committee has received strong advice that the Smith recommendation is not being met and that the clause is confused, to say the least. So, no fulfilment of Pillar 2 of the Smith Agreement, let alone a more cohesive approach. Or indeed, a settlement that is, to quote, responsive to the changing needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland, as outlined in Clause 17 of the introduction to the Smith Agreement. Cohesion would mean listening to practitioners and others about what would be sensible in welfare devolution. Cohesion would mean serious consideration to employment issues, meeting the commitment of devolving all employment support services and looking at whether further devolution such as Job Centre Plus would give a more cohesive system. Cohesion would mean the ability to use equality legislation to make our system fairer. Cohesion plus being responsive to aspiration would mean capitalising on all of that and taking control of, for example, the full devolution of powers over the minimum wage, employment law, health and safety and trade union law. I think particularly worth discussion just now is trade union law and I hope uh, that the Labour Party will join with the SNP in asking ourselves and the STUC um, and come along with ourselves and the STUC in asking for full power over trade union law. When you look at what's been proposed, it's been mentioned earlier in Westminster just now, surely that is something that we can reach agreement on to try and protect and promote the rights and responsibilities of workers in Scotland. Cohesion means pulling all the strands together. But you have to have control over the strands before you can start knitting them together to create something sensible. And I think that's what, what we should all be aiming for. I am aware that the Scotland office just now is punting out statements in social media and other places saying we are meeting the terms of the Smith Agreement. They quite clearly are not. I think it's disingenuous to pretend that they are. I mean, in the House of Commons on 15th July, um, it was stated by the Secretary of State that it was his intention to make substantive amendments in the House of Commons when the bill comes back under the report. So, quite clearly, at the moment, the bill does not meet the Smith Agreement. It doesn't seem to me, from the evidence that we have heard at committee, that there is the intention to get there, let alone go beyond. Uh, I'd like to, to finish, uh, Presiding Officer, just by going back to the report of the Smith Commission. And in his foreword, Lord Smith of Kelvin said, I took on the job in the knowledge that the three leaders of the main UK parties had committed to take the recommendations set out in the agreement and turn them into law, fulfilling their commitment to strengthen the powers of the Scottish Parliament within the UK. It's quite clear to me that that commitment is not being met and I would call on the three main parties within the UK to meet their own commitment and work together with us to achieve the best for Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate on democracy and devolution. On Friday, it will be a year to the day since Scotland voted decisively to stay part of the United Kingdom with a strong Scottish Parliament armed with more powers to strengthen the present constitutional arrangements to serve Scotland better. Meeting the aspirations of the Scottish people for a strong Scottish Parliament and at the same time strengthening the United Kingdom. Scottish, Scottish Labour is a party of both devolution and the union and for over 100 years now we have led the argument for Scottish devolution within the union and it is a cause that we have advanced out of deep-seated conviction. 
Devolution can and should be strengthened where it is in the interests of the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, that is why I believe that Scotland needs the full powers promised in the Smith Commission to be able to create its own welfare powers and that the Scotland Bill must go further to give the Scottish Parliament more control over the welfare state. At Westminster, we have put down over 80 amendments to the Scotland Bill, including amendments which would devolve housing benefit and also remove the veto of UK ministers over welfare powers. Indeed, last week, last week's report by Professor Jim Gallagher, which stated that the Scotland Bill must go further to give the Scottish Parliament more control over the welfare state is yet more evidence that the UK Government should accept Labour's amendments. As my colleague Claire Baker mentioned earlier, today we have announced new amendments to the Scotland Bill, which would see the Scottish Parliament take control of a further £5 billion of revenue and the powers to design a new social security system for Scotland. These amendments include measures to assign all revenue from VAT, ensure the Scottish Parliament can top up welfare benefits even where the individuals have been sanctioned, and to give the Scottish Government the power to create any new benefit. Amendments have also been submitted to investigate the concerns raised by many charities across Scotland regarding the impact of new income tax powers on the gift aid system. Our amendments would significantly increase the powers currently in the Scotland Bill and ensure our Parliament is one of the most powerful devolved legislatures in the world. This is a real opportunity for people across Scotland and we want to make sure they get the powerhouse parliament at Holyrood that they were promised. However, as Claire Baker's amendment states, we must recognise that devolution should not stop at the Scottish Parliament but should go on to create more effective delivery of public services. We know that Scotland is one of the most centralised nations in Europe with our local authorities' powers decreasing in recent years. I believe that responsibility over key policy areas needs to be handed back over to regional government. And the new powers coming to our parliament would be a perfect opportunity to do this. In our Devolution Commission report, we recommended the full devolution of responsibility for delivery of the work programme to local authorities on the basis that they are better placed to meet the requirements of local labour markets. This would enhance demo democratic accountability and empower people in greater local decision making. However, it is essential and right that the Scottish Parliament play a key role in providing strategic oversight of local authority delivery of this service. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish Labour Party are focused not just on making sure that the Scottish Parliament gets the powers that it needs, but also on how we will use these powers to improve the lives of people across the country. It was never the intention of devolution to devolve power to the Scottish Parliament, only to see it accumulate powers upwards. We must use the new powers coming our way to strengthen devolution, increase accountability and better meet people's needs. Thank you very much. I'm afraid uh, the extra time we had has now gone, so I must ask members to be strict with themselves, please, in keeping to the six minutes. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer, and uh, I warmly welcome this debate this afternoon. On the 21st of May this year, we had a debate on the devolution for the Powers Committee report into the draft clauses published by the, the former UK government in January. And as we all know, that the, that report was signed off unanimously by all parties on the devolution for the Powers Committee, and that was uh, no mean feat. And I think all credit certainly has to go to uh, my colleague Bruce Crawford uh, for, uh, for how he managed to, to achieve that. But, and on, but on that day when we had this debate, uh, I spoke about uh, two issues, one of which was fixed odds betting terminals and also employment programmes. 
And I'm I do intend returning to the fixed odds betting terminal just for a few moments, uh, as this, uh, this, this issue, like many other parts of the Scotland Bill, is, uh, in my opinion, unfinished business. Now, the fixed odds betting terminals are FOB Ts. Uh, it's something I have raised in Parliament uh, on a number of occasions now, and because uh, I have been consistent in raising my concerns because these machines are damaging, uh, and I have campaigned for powers to come to this Parliament uh, so that, uh, that we can actually do something about them. And uh, at the time, I warmly welcomed the Smith's recommendations uh, to give powers to the Parliament, even though that these, uh, these powers were to be limited. However, what we actually have in the Scotland Bill now is an outcome that is actually going to create confusion for all. As the Bill currently stands, uh, the new powers will deliver a system whereby premises uh, with these FOBT machines or class subcategory 2B machines to give them their, their proper legal title will be governed by legislation from both the UK Parliament and also here. The clause in the Bill will give us powers for new machines and leave existing machines to the UK Parliament. Now, I think that that is uh, an incredibly silly and convoluted way to actually deal with this issue, which is blighting communities across Scotland. And the Law Society proposed amendments to improve this part of the Bill, and uh, I would encourage the Secretary of State to think again on the issue. And if he is serious and is in listening mode, as uh, he indicated he was when he was in front of the Devolution for the Powers Committee in June, then he needs to be clear, he needs to clear up this FOBT mess. I also would encourage him to explain where the, the £10 limit it came from in Clause 45 in the Bill. Now, this figure seems arbitrary, and I certainly I can decipher no clear rationale uh, for that £10 limit. Now, the second issue I'm going to touch upon today is that uh, regarding well, it's the definition of carers, disability and also new benefits. Now, section 54 of Smith was clear in terms of creating new benefits and top-up and the top-up of reserve benefits. However, the Scotland Bill falls short on the provision of powers to create new benefits in devolved areas, uh, not to mention the restrictive definition placed upon carers. However, Clause 23 in the Bill lacks clarity on the matter. Now, the letter uh, dated the 26th of August uh, from the Secretary of State uh, to, uh, to our committee explains that the position of the UK Government. Uh, the letter says, the welfare provisions in the Bill fully deliver the Smith Commission Agreement. But the next paragraph states that there is no power in the Bill to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility because the UK Government believes the Scottish Parliament already has this power. Now, if that actually were to be the case, and I'll give the UK Government a wee bit of some benefit of the doubt just for this particular point, then why did the Conservative and Liberal Democrat members who were on the Smith Commission sign off in Section 54 of Smith? Now, Section 54 of Smith reads... The Scottish Parliament will have new powers to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility in line with the funding principle set out in paragraph 95. Now, surely the Conservative and Liberal Democrat members would have been aware of the position of the now, of, sorry, of the position now proposed by the Secretary of State when he writes, by definition, if the area is one of devolved responsibility, then the Scottish Parliament has full legislative competence to enact legislation in that area as long as this does not also relate to a reserve matter, including the provision of new benefits, should it wish to do so. So either the members on Smith displayed an ignorance to the so-called facts, which I don't believe for one minute, or there is now a sense of backtracking coming from Dover House on this particular issue. And a further point that I genuinely find bizarre is that of the restrictive definition of carers. If this Parliament is to have the powers to deal with the limited additional powers that are to come through this Bill, then why has the restrictive definition of carers been included in the Bill? Now, this will surely limit the actions of future governments in this Parliament in, in introducing measures to assist with carers. Now, the Secretary of State explains in his position in the letter once again, highlighting that those under 16 are not normally supported by the benefit system and that those in education are, are normally supported through grants, bursaries or EMA. However, the life of a carer is hard. There are many carers in Scotland, and I would expect across the UK, who are under 16. And for many, any additional assistance would be hugely beneficial, and it might actually allow them to continue their education with a little bit of the stress alleviated. And who knows, presiding officer, uh, with, if we can remove this narrow definition, that might actually provide a further tool for future governments, uh, and also this government, to deal with the education attainment issue that's been widely discussed in recent months. Now, tying the hands of future governments in this Parliament uh, by enforcing such a restrictive definition does the UK Government absolutely no credit 
and it will also maintain the difficulties for young carers. Uh, you need to bring your remarks to a close. Sure, no, okay, presenting officer. In conclusion, uh, we have heard from members across the chamber where they believe that the bill either goes far enough or doesn't go far enough, and for me, clearly, it falls far short. Of, uh, of the Smith recommendations, but actually, I think all members on the devolution committee, uh, they have they have done a tremendous job in actually putting forward um, and showing how we actually can try to, to work uh, together to, to get the best outcomes for our constituents. But and certainly, as the bill stands, it doesn't do that by any manner of means. And the Secretary of State needs to listen and act at the report stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob Gibson, to be followed by Michael McMahon. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to comment, uh, first of all, on a couple of items that have uh, cropped up in the debate from the amendments from Labour and the Conservatives. There was uh, some hint that uh, there would be uh, an agreement that local communities and empowering people in a greater local decision-making issue was something that Labour believes in, and that somehow or other the SNP was opposed to having more decentralisation. Nothing could be further from the truth. Indeed, in terms of the Crown Estate, which I come to, we would only, not only talk about having decentralisation of local authorities and harbour trusts, but to other local bodies. So, for example, that shows the decentralisation tendency. But I'd like to know whether, in fact, uh, local uh, communities actually mean local authorities in Labour's mind, or does it actually mean local communities? They better explain that in their closing speeches. The second point I would suggest needs looked at is the one in which uh, the Conservatives talk about uh, making the Scottish Parliament one of the most powerful sub-national legislatures in the world. Do the Tories actually think it is acceptable for the Scotland Bill to include vetoes over universal credit and energy schemes, despite there being no mention in Smith of the UK having the ability to veto the Scottish Government's decisions. That clearly falls far short of the Smith uh, conditions and indeed is a lack of good faith in my view. Now, turning to the Crown Estate, which uh, my own and my committee's uh, interests have lain, the drafting of the clause is complex and much of the detail to be set out in the statutory scheme a draft of which has been laid in the House of Commons. The assets to be transferred under the bill exclude the Clown Estate's stake in Fort Kinnear Business Park, which could be worth more than £100 million. It also includes major caveats relating to defence, national security and electricity distribution, as I hinted at in my previous discussion about the, the Tory position. Now, the Crown Estate, as such, is perhaps one of the areas which this Parliament has spent the longest to try to get devolved. Indeed, some of us have been involved for the last 20 or 30 years to get aspects of it devolved. And uh, that devolution has been slower than, ice, uh, that than uh, glaciers melting, although these have speeded up and perhaps this bill might speed it up a little bit now. But the point is that the Crown Estate Act, you know, if it were to apply properly to the new managers, uh, then the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament you know, have to be able to put our own legislative arrangements in place. But what we're faced with is a Treasury that's intent on giving with one hand and then caveating it with another. So in Clause 31, 2 and 6, it allows us to transfer assets and contains detail of that. But in Clause 31, 10, it actually stops or potentially stops uh, the Scottish Parliament from taking those actions. Uh, the, the provision would appear to undercut the freedom granted by clauses, clauses 31 2 and 31 6 to modify the way in which the Crown Estate in Scotland is currently managed. What kind of devolution of powers is that? We have to ask ourselves exactly what to expect. Indeed, Professor Aileen McCarg, in giving evidence last week to our committee, when asked about uh, Clause 3110, agreed that it should be struck off and indeed removed from the Scotland Bill. We look to the Conservatives to tell us what their position on that is. Now, a further problem about uh, the way in which we might apply uh, ourselves uh, to the use of the Crown Estate facilities and uh, assets uh, was questioned by Professor Ian McLean. 
And he took the example that had been raised about us perhaps passing some of the assets to social enterprises and thereby reducing to some extent the potential actual value of the estate of the Crown. So under Smith no detriment principles, another vague area, the rest of the UK could, as he said, play hardball and say you have reduced the revenue uh, that comes to you from the Crown estate, so you must bear the risk of that. And he said, I am simply pointing out that that is a risk to the Parliament using the powers in that way. That is not to say that it is wrong to do it. It is just a risk. Why would we have to face a risk in attempting to devolve the powers of the Crown estate? These are the kinds of issues which bedevil this whole process and which I think shows that the process of devolution has been made much more tortuous by this bill than the draft clauses were. And the Treasury's reluctance is something which shows very bad faith indeed about its relationship with Scotland. And I hope that we can get this sorted out in the next while. But I hope that the other parties of whom I've asked questions answer these questions in this debate. Thank you, President Officer. Michael McMahon, followed by Nigel Don. Thank you, President Officer. In the run-up to the referendum last year, I was a member of both the Welfare Reform and the Finance Committees. And so I heard a number of eminent academics discuss a wide array of fiscal issues in the context of both independence and devolution. When it came to discussions on the devolution of powers, as members might imagine, there was a fair spread of opinion on what the complexities of that process might entail especially when it came specifically to welfare issues. Now, one of the SNP's favourite go-to academics, Professor John Kay, boiled down the argument quite simply to saying that it's difficult to unpick welfare issues from everything else. He suggested that we are faced with a choice of all or nothing as regards what to devolve. Now, other academics had some sympathy with John Kay's position, but the overwhelming majority were of the opinion that any difficulty is not simply that the benefit system is complicated, but that all changes, whatever they are, run considerable risks of some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in our society uh, being disadvantaged further, and we have to approach whatever is done with great care. The benefit system is complex and there are many interactions. Benefits interact with each other, they interact with the tax system, and they interact with other social services, most notably health and social care. So whatever we do, it's likely that benefits will be tied to, uh, that whatever benefits are tied to will have implications for other parts of the system. And so we must always be aware of that. So before we start unpicking bits of the settlement and asking what benefits should be devolved, we need to think about the tests that we might apply to make sure that further devolution is feasible, affordable, and will help with issues including poverty reduction, which should be our primary purpose. Will further devolution help to achieve those ends? There was some consensus overall that at the very least devolution of housing benefit would be beneficial. But any debate on the implications of some powers and not others must also consider the sorts of problems that could arise in relation to financial coordination. But most importantly, before we start asking which benefit may be devolved, we need to think about the tests that we might apply to make sure that further devolution is feasible. As a principle, there is to be a devolution of, if there is to be a devolution of benefits, we need to accept that the terms of benefits will have to vary. There is not much point in devolving benefits if the terms do not vary and benefits remain completely uniform. What that leads us to is almost the opposite of the parity principle that is used in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland works on the principle that the system must be close, if not identical, to what happens in the rest of Britain. Now, that's not really a principle of devolution. If we have to look at any form of devolution, we need to talk about the opposite approach, which is the presumption that it is legitimate and even desirable for benefit conditions to be different. Now, having different levels of social security between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom is not new. As Scotland's poor law was certainly different um, in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom before the creation of the welfare state. But what has to be recognised is going back to such a situation, irrespective of any difficulties between benefits and the tax system, is that any new system is going to have a cost. There is no question about that. 
Ultimately, further devolution needs to be financed in a way that means that the savings that would flow from a better programme performance in Scotland would stay in Scotland, and any additional costs through higher expenditure or poorer for performance should also be within the core part of the Scottish budget. It is a grown-up approach to further devolution. In arguing against Professor Kay's all-or-nothing position, it should also be noted that the Scottish Parliament has already varied the social security system in three important respects – the bedroom tax, the council tax rebate scheme and the abolition of the social fund. Now, Labour amendments to the Scotland Bill that have been lodged today would see the Scottish Parliament take control of a further £5 billion of revenue and the powers to design a new social security system for Scotland. And I think that is absolutely right that that is what we pursue. It is continuation of the devolution process. But the outcome of the referendum said to me that the people of Scotland want to remain in some kind of social and economic union with the UK, but they also want that union to change. And they want further devolution in this area to be a reasonable and feasible part of that change process. I think it is clear that differences in attitudes to social security have caused enormous friction and tension in Britain. But there should be a general presumption that in a political union we share a common social security system for, amongst other things, the mobility of labour and social solidarity. That is what Scotland voted for and that is what this Parliament should be focused on delivering. I think we have to keep our eye on the ball. I think we have to accept that what is on the table at the present time is not exactly what we set out to achieve. I think the amendments that we are putting forward will take us closer to that position. But I think that the, the Scottish Government have got a responsibility. And whatever actions they take in order to address the complexities that I know that the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is, is grappling with, and we have seen them already through the, the, the problems around uh, LBTT, and the, uh, the landfill tax, that even when it comes to small taxes like that, the complexities of change make it difficult. And, and what I would uh, ask the, the Cabinet Secretary to take on board is that whenever he's arguing for the, the fiscal responsibility argument, that he focuses on that and takes us all with him. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel Dawn, to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would uh, like to address sections one and two of the bill, but I want to make it clear that in my remarks I am not attempting to rehearse constitutional arguments. I am at this point entirely concerned with the practicalities of the drafting of what we have before us and the evidence which has been heard particularly by the Devolution and Further Powers Committee as to what those uh, amendments might actually mean in law. Section one talks about permanence and it's Section 111A one, one, one says that the Scottish Parliament is recognised as having been as a permanent part of the United Kingdom's constitutional arrangements. The evidence, presiding officer, is that that phraseology really does not help. Is recognised does not do anything in law. Um, and actually, it probably doesn't add to the position. Our law and legal systems work quite simply on the basis that the law is the law for the time being. We changed only last week, I think, uh, the law on disclosure. We know we're going to have to reconsider that as time goes by. We will then, if necessary, change it again, and it will become the law again for the time being. And we know very well that no parliament can bind its successors, and it may be that that and every other issue get revisited in the next parliament. There is nothing to be gained by saying that something is recognised. It might as well say that Scottish Parliament is a permanent member of the United Kingdom's constitutional arrangements or actually say nothing at all. The other issue on permanence, of course, is that, despite constitutional theory to the opposite, the Treaty of Union in Article 19 does say, effectively, that the Scottish legal system is understood to remain in all time coming. Uh, it has proved to be the case for several centuries, and there's no reason why we shouldn't say something is permanent. If I then go on to section two, we have the same problem with it is recognised in the context of Sewell, but I would like to deal with that in a very different way. Lord Sewell, in his discussion, when he set out the Sewell motion policy, which he did on the 21st of July in 1998 in a debate in the House of Lords, actually set it out as a policy statement. And he did so in a speech in which he actually included the text of the amendment to which he was speaking above. 
I therefore find it quite astonishing that the Scottish government, sorry, the UK government's response to Smith to say that that should be set out in statute is to quite literally put it in the statute in Lord Sewell's words. That is naive, facile, and quite frankly, it's the kind of legislative drafting which a first-year student should know better than. If we were going to do that the rest of the time, we would simply have a policy memorandum, presiding officer, annotate it with sections, section numbers, and put it in front of committees. The reality is that the Sewell Convention is actually laid out in a government document. It's laid out in Devol Devolution Guidance number 10. It was set out in 1998. The latest version has been there since 2005. And as I understand it, it has never been breached. Those are the terms that say what the convention really is. And if we're going to put anything at all in statute, it should actually be that. What the guidance tells UK government departments is what they will do. Not what they may do, what they will do. It is entirely clear that they have to consult, and section 9 of it at 2 effectively says that that consultation and agreement must have been reached before the final decision-making process in Westminster. It doesn't say maybe, it says it will be done. It does, on its face, cover emergency and exceptional circumstances. What we have in front of us does not. What we have in front of us does also not cover the full range of the Sewell Convention. And that is the fundamental point to which I would now like to return. Sewell actually covers three issues. It covers I can find them, matters on which we may legislate. Sorry, yes, it covers legislation on the issues which we may legislate. It covers the powers of this government, of this parliament, pardon me, and it covers the powers of ministers. What we have before us in section two quite clearly does not potentially cover all of those and may only cover the first point. The Scottish Government has brought forward proposals. They are in the public domain. They clearly address precisely that issue. So in summing up, presiding officer, what we have before us is at least badly drafted. What we have about the Sewell Convention is nothing more than a naive statement of a piece of policy that was set out by Lord Sewell. The convention itself is quite clearly on paper on that government guidance. If it is going to be legislated for, then that is what should be in the legislation, complete with exceptions, which are not, ex which are not disputed. Um, and it also, if it were done that way, quite clearly covers the powers of this parliament and the powers of Scottish ministers as well as the ability of UK government to legislate on issues on which we could legislate. Thank you. Thank you, Alison Johnson, to be followed by Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In preparing for today's debate, I reread the vow, the signed historic joint promise made by David Cameron, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg, and carried by the Daily Record exactly a year ago today. Now, I'm firmly of the view that those three Westminster party leaders felt compelled to sign this promise to the people of Scotland following polling on the referendum question. Because let's face it, signing a joint pledge promising extensive new powers wouldn't have been on their week-by-week -week referendum planners. But whatever your view, what we were witnessing were people in politics meeting on the front page of a popular national newspaper. And I do think the vow can be considered symbolic of an incredible shared experience where people and politics came together. And this change dynamic is needed and welcomed, where people are involved, taking part, sharing views, and not simply having politics done on their behalf by a few representatives. And in their briefing for today's debate, the Electoral Reform Society Scotland ask, one year on, have we honoured the legacy of this energised and enthused nation? The ERS, I would suggest, think not, and I am inclined to agree with them. Now, the ERS, and witness after witness to the committee, has commented on the haste in which this particular part of the devolution process has progressed. Indeed, Professor Aileen McHarg, Professor of Public Law at the University of Strathclyde, says, it is hardly an original observation to say that the process that has been followed so far has been unsatisfactory. 
But I do think it is really important to remember what it was like in Scotland in the lead up to the referendum, how people packed out public meeting halls, how passionate pub and kitchen table conversations were being had around the country, and how it felt like we were all part of an important decision. We were learning to discuss and debate issues that mattered. That's not divisive, it's empowering. Now, today, we will support the government's motion and Labour's amendment. We can't support the amendment in Annabelle Goldie's name. Um, the amendment asks that we continue to scrutinise the bill in an objective and constructive way to allow identification of appropriate improvements. Yet it deletes reference to the unanimously agreed objective and constructive findings of the Devolution Committee that the bill, in its current form, doesn't fully deliver the recommendations of the Commission. But the Conservative Amendment also states that extensive constitutional change is best brought about by building a broad consensus between political parties and governments. Well, that's very important, but it does exclude, or at least it forgets to mention, the people of Scotland. Participation takes time and effort, but it does lead to a better outcome. I, mean, I don't believe that any considered body of experts charged with deserving optimal outcomes for people would have designed the devolution of welfare powers that are currently on offer. And without deriding the powers that are going to be devolved, there is real concern that these powers aren't sufficient or broad enough to help us make the system work. And the Crown Estate is another area where the devolution proposals seems to have been designed by someone who really didn't want this to happen. When the Smith Commission says responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament, people understand that as a pretty simple devolution of everything. Yet this isn't the case. We will have a double stream Crown Estate and a complex transfer scheme. And currently, Scotland will see no financial benefit from assets like Fort Canaird. Now, in the vow, David Cameron, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg agreed that the Scottish Parliament is permanent. And as we on the Devolution Committee know, the current drafting regarding this important provision has provided academics with many challenges and continues to do so. Presiding officer, the Smith Commission was hurriedly convened, delivered its report, and now we debate whether the Scotland Bill delivers its intent and the change agreed by those who represented Scotland's people on the Commission. But we do need to insist and be part of a new type of politics. People I speak to aren't concerned about whether or not a party leader is wearing a tie. They'd like to understand and debate the need for the ermine-clad House of Lords. And they believe that we need the devolution of gender politics to this parliament. Surely that is essential to a new politics. The further devolution of the powers we are discussing today, the way in which these powers are being devolved, mean that positive intergovernmental relations are essential. Jim McCormack in evidence noted that the Smith Commission observed that the intergovernmental working was weak. He focused in particular on the impact this could have in the context of welfare devolution. Sharing powers in relation to universal credit demands a mature relationship and a commitment to work for the greater good. The Scottish Federation of Housing Associations too agreed that the interconnections will be complex and the people who rely on benefits are often vulnerable. Presiding officer, we will of course look forward to progress at the report stage in the UK Parliament so that this bill does indeed match the spirit and substance of the Smith Commission. But in order to do so, we need clarity on the Sewell Convention, we need clarity on the Crown Estate, on welfare benefits, on definitions of carers and disability, employment programmes and much, much more. The Westminster Government has much to do to deliver a Scotland bill that matches the intent of the Smith Commission. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Jamidi. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to, for the opportunity to speak and what I think has been an interesting debate on Scotland's democracy. The Scottish Parliament as an institution is a direct reflection of the democratic will of the people of Scotland. And Bruce Crawford, as a veteran of that first parliament elected in 1999, quite rightly raised the issue of the permanency of this parliament as an institution. The question surely is this, are we a subordinate legislature an underling of Westminster, or are we a sovereign parliament accountable to the people of Scotland? And part of the answer to that question was provided in the motion passed by this parliament by 102 votes to 14 when we debated the claim of right on the 27th of January 2012. 
And that motion stated that the Parliament acknowledges the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to their needs and declares and pledges that in all its actions and deliberations their interests shall be paramount. I believe the people of Scotland know where they stand. They want the Scottish Parliament to be a powerful Parliament, they want it to be a sovereign Parliament and they want it to be a permanent Parliament. It is therefore incumbent on the UK Government to heed the calls from the Devolution for the Powers Committee and to set out what steps it intends to take to give practical and legislative expression to that clear aspiration set out by the Committee. Alex Johnson. Is there not at least an equal and opposite requirement for this Government to acknowledge the outcome of last year's referendum and understand that this process is not a means by which to continue to campaign endlessly for the independence that the Scottish people rejected? Jimmy Day. Uh, the, the, the member is absolutely entitled to put forward that point of view, and I think that all of us in this chamber respect the democratic will of the people of Scotland. But equally, it is not um, democratic to deny the people of Scotland the right to determine their own future. Now, it was Mrs Thatcher, a heroine of uh, Alec Johnson's, who famously was able to abolish the Greater London Council, not quite by the stroke of a pen, but certainly by parliamentary diktat, precisely because it was a creature of statute. And that is, there is nothing in the bill, as Nigel Don set out compellingly in his contribution, that would prevent a future UK government hostile to the Scottish Parliament from abolishing this Parliament as an institution. And the potential threat to this Parliament exists because, as A.V. Dicey stated in 1885, there is no power which under the English Constitution can come into rivalry with the legislative sovereignty of Parliament. Therefore, the suggestion that an, an amendment should be lodged to require a referendum of the Scottish electorate to be held if the issue of the par Parliament's permanency was ever in question, as well as being subject to a vote of the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament, seems to me to be an eminently sensible and constructive suggestion, and one which I hope the UK Government will respond to positively. In taking these steps, the UK Government would be respecting the will of the people of Scotland and the wishes of this Parliament, it would also show due respect to the Scottish concept of popular sovereignty, resting as it does with the people, a concept which we can trace back to the Declaration of Our Broth. And that concept is in stark contrast to the unlimited sovereignty of Westminster, which the Lord President Cooper famously referred to as being a distinctively English principle, which has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. Now, the Cabinet Secretary set out in some detail the fact that the vow has not been fulfilled, and a number of speakers underlined the views of the Devolution Further Powers Committee that the Scotland Bill does not fulfil either the spirit or the content of the Smith Commission. Lewis MacDonald um, also warned us not to conflate the two, uh, and I think we all heard um, his contribution. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary and Malcolm uh, Chisholm both highlighted the importance of a fair fiscal framework. And these are issues which have been the subject of expert analysis by two of my constituents, the highly respected economists Margaret and Jim Cuthbert. They warn that income tax is an unsuitable choice as the primary vehicle for giving the Scottish Parliament greater fiscal responsibility. They state the Scottish Government has been given responsibility for living within its tax red, uh, resources without being given adequate powers to grow the economy and hence its tax base. And I think that these, we would do well to heed their warnings in relation uh, to these proposed fiscal arrangements. Linda Fabiani lamented the lack of a cohesive approach in relation to welfare, employment, Job and job creation, and did so in a way which highlighted the need to secure further powers over these matters in order to meet the aspirations of the people of Scotland. Malcolm Chisholm highlighted the lack of clarity um, on new benefits and top-up payments, as did other speakers, including uh, Stuart Macmillan. Mark Macdonald dealt with the issue of dividend income accruing to the UK Exchequer, possibly undermining the principle of no detriment. And Tavish Scott, what I thought was an excellent contribution, notwithstanding the, the cynical um, blip um, mid-speech, mid, mid 
made the perfectly reasonable case that what we are seeking is a progressive and durable uh, settlement within a family of nations. And he's absolutely entitled to argue that federalism uh, is one way of achieving that. I agreed with his conclusion that in the medium to longer term, we are looking at a federal solution or independence, and that will be uh, the democratic um, will of the Scottish people, um, regardless of which uh, outcome um, finally uh, occurs. Presiding officer, the publication of the Scotland Bill should have been a democratic milestone, a chance for the Scottish Parliament to gain further powers to take Scotland forward. We must ensure that it does not become a fiscal and political millstone and a barrier to further progress in the years ahead. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches. I call Gavin Brown. Mr Brown, six minutes. Presiding officer, thank you very much. We have had a lot of positive contributions to the debate today. And I have to say, personally, I will reflect on a number of them. I thought we had excellent ones, in particular from Malcolm Chisholm when he was talking about welfare, uh, from Nigel Dawn on a slightly technical issue, but I think well covered in relation to the Seoul Convention. And while I might not agree with uh, all of the conclusions that both they and others reached, uh, there's certainly, from my point of view, uh, food for thought and things that I uh, will reflect upon personally. Um, I don't think the Scotland Bill is perfect as it is. Uh, of course, there are parts of it that could be improved. Of course, there are parts of it uh, that are badly drafted. But certainly, in my view, uh, the UK government is adhering to the spirit and substance of the Smith Commission, has done and will continue to do so, so that we do have the best possible bill for an enduring settlement within Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And I just say to uh, some members who spoke today, the approach taken by those who came forward with positive suggestions and didn't over-egg the pudding, I just think will be far more effective and do the par Parliament a far greater service than those who try to traduce everything uh, that the UK Government does and challenges its intentions along the way. And I say in particular to Mr Swinney, who uh, gave a more measured speech today, I was very disappointed uh, in his press release today where um, he said this. He said in a Scottish Government press release, the bill takes every opportunity to constrain and limit new powers and utterly fails to deliver the spirit of the Smith Commission. Now, presenting officer, I don't know if John Swinney actually believes that or thinks that, but I don't think anyone who is being fair-minded and reasonable and genuine about the process could believe that that statement is true. And I say to members, uh, and I say to Mr Swinney in particular, why not put his undoubted energy and ability into getting the best possible Scotland bill that we can instead of taking swipes like that, which I, gen I genuinely don't think that he believes to be true, but he may uh, disagree and come back in his closing. Presenting officer, oh, sorry, Mr McDonald wants to go, sure. Mark McDonald. I, I hear what the member is saying, but the member will be aware that the Scottish Government is writing repeatedly to the UK Government and engaged in discussions with the UK Government to precisely that end. But can I ask Gavin Brown, does he agree with the Prime Minister, who has said now on more than one occasion at the dispatch box that the Scotland Bill is delivering the Smith Commission recommendations in full? Y yes, I do, been. and I think it will continue to do so. But to say that, to say that doesn't mean that you don't think it can be improved. And I think, as I acknowledged at the start, it definitely can be improved. Uh, wording can be tightened up. And yes, there are areas where it isn't, uh, isn't perfect. So, yeah, but I think by the time the process is complete, I think we'll be in a better position. But, Presiding Officer, I just think it's very unfair to say that it utterly fails to deliver, because if we look at what has been discussed in the Chamber today, a lot of the headline issues that were front and centre when the Smith Commission was published have barely merited a mention today. Almost nothing about income tax today, the biggest tax across the country. Almost nothing. There was something, but almost nothing on VAT at the second largest tax. Almost nothing on APD. Absolutely nothing on 16 and 17 year olds being given the vote. These were some of the headline issues, not all of them, but some of the headline issues of the Smith Commission that haven't gotten a mention. Why? Because both the UK government and the Scottish government have got on with the job and done what they're supposed to do. And I think if we put our attentions in a similar way to where there are remaining issues, there's no doubt in my mind, not at this stage, no doubt in my mind that we can get similar results, presenting officer. And I want to come back to a point that Annabel Goldie made, because again, it's easy to say, uh, as many uh, uh, nationalist members have done, that the Smith Commission does nothing. It transfers powers that don't add up, powers that are worth very little indeed. I would refute that absolutely, presenting officer. 
If we look at, and it's a, it becomes uh, something of a cliche to use the expression, powerhouse parliament, but I think genuinely uh, that it is. If you look at the laws for which we have responsibility, it's quite hard to measure in cash terms, but there will be very few devolved parliaments that have greater legislative reach than we do at the moment, and that we will once the Scotland Bill is enacted. There are very few devolved parliaments on the planet that have greater spending power and ability than us. And that's one of the reasons, I have to say, why the Scottish Government only talk about our spending responsibilities in welfare. They are the only political party in the world that will look at spending and tax, but when it comes to spending, they only talk about the percentage of spending we have over welfare. Why? Because if you talk about the percentage of spending we have as a whole, it's a big figure and one that doesn't suit their narrative and their argument. According to Scottish Government figures in JERS this year, we're responsible for 65% of all Scottish spending in here. 65% of it is devolved, which puts us right at the top of devolved nations. In relation to tax, where there was a big weakness, presenting officer, most analysts said there was a vertical fiscal imbalance, and I think they were right. But post-Smith, we will be responsible, again according to JERS, for approximately 40% of taxes in Scotland. So we're spending over 65%. We're responsible for the collection of 40%, presiding officer. And as David Bell said at the time, who has been quoted by others today, implementing Smith will mean that in terms of fiscal federalism, Scotland will be closer to Canadian provinces and Swiss cantons, which are at the extreme end of the spectrum of devolved fiscal powers among OECD countries. Now, yes, there will be one or two others who are slightly higher, but we will be ahead of almost all of them. For that reason, presiding officer, I support obviously Annabel Gordy's amendment and urge the Scottish Government to do all that they can from their side. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now call on Lewis MacDonald? Ms MacDonald, eight minutes. Thank you very much. This debate has been about the process of devolution and about its purpose. Among other things, devolution decentralises the governance of Britain and modernises the British state. Promoting Scottish devolution does not weaken the United Kingdom. It does not disadvantage other parts of the Union. David Cameron's big idea of English votes for English laws is divisive and ultimately self-defeating because it misunderstands the nature of Scottish devolution. Devolution is firmly compatible with the ideals of the European Union. It derives from the principle of subsidiarity, devolving powers and responsibilities to the most local level practically possible. That principle is essential if a union of states on the scale of the European Union is to remain democratic and locally accountable. But it is just as relevant at the level of the United Kingdom and within Scotland itself. That is why our amendment today calls for double devolution, the transfer of powers to this place from Westminster and the transfer of powers from here to a local community level. It also calls for local people to be empowered by greater local decision-making, reversing the centralisation of Scotland's public services, which has been a feature of the last eight years. So devolution is about democracy and accountability, but that is not the whole story. Devolution in the present day is also about enabling social and economic change. Those things have not always gone together. Some of the most far-reaching social and economic reforms in Scottish history were delivered in the context of a unitary British state from nationalisation of the railways to creation of the NHS. But in embracing devolution, the Labour Party has embraced it as a means to further progressive social and economic change, not as an end in itself. And that is how we see the Smith Agreement and the Scotland Bill, and that is how we have approached today's debate. The Smith Agreement covers a wide range of policy areas. It, its most important provisions are to transfer tax powers to the Scottish Parliament and to provide for powers in the field of Social Security to be shared between Holyrood and Westminster. The tax changes increase our accountability as members of the Scottish Parliament by making us responsible for raising revenues as well as spending it. The combination of tax and welfare powers gives us the opportunity to create a distinctive and progressive system of social security in Scotland in the context of the wider British welfare state, an opportunity to improve the lives of those who have the least. But it is simply wrong to say that the Scotland Bill has failed on all fronts or that it does not fulfil the vow to devolve extensive new powers to the Scottish Parliament in any way. Indeed, the Devolution Committee's interim report concluded that the bill fully reflected Smith 
in a number of areas, but required amendment or clarification in a number of others. And those were conclusions to which all parties agreed, though many of us wish to go further. It is, of course, true that the Bill falls short in the area of welfare, as Michael McMahon and others said. And it is also true to say that the Tory Government at Westminster has yet to accept any of the many amendments to the Scotland Bill moved by Labour, the SNP or the Liberal Democrats, and indeed have made few concessions to the issues raised uh, on a cross-party basis by the Devolution for the Power Committee of this Parliament. Alex Johnson. Would the member agree that there is a certain irony, in particular in the use of the, both the government and the government's backbenchers, of the issue of uh, welfare and the demands it would appear for additional expenditure, while apparently ignoring the taxation responsibilities which that would bring with it? Lewis MacDonald. Well, I think the point was well made uh, by Gavin Brown that, that income tax is a, an important part of the devolution package and something which should be highlighted. But, of course, that does not mean that the approach of the Conservative government on Social Security is one that is supported by other parties. And it is disappointing that the, the Westminster government has not seen fit to accept any of such a wide range of positive and helpful amendments to improve uh, the package. But, of course, for those of us who do not agree with the Tory approach to Social Security, I don't think we should be deterred just because a Conservative government digs its heels in and resists amendments to achieve social and economic reform. Mr Cameron's ministers, after all, are undermining the welfare state and the rights and freedoms of working people on a daily basis. It is hardly, therefore, surprising that they also are, are resisting changes to the Scotland Bill proposed by those who want to use it to create a fairer and more equal society. So, if the Conservatives at Westminster persist, so should the opposition parties, and so should we. Devolution, after all, is a process, not an event. What one Scotland Act fails to deliver, another Scotland Bill can propose to make happen. That has been the history of the last 18 years, and if all parties cannot agree in the next few months, then it may well be the case again. Of course, devolution is a process, not an event, but nor is it a transitional demand. The failure of the Conservatives to accept opposition amendments should not be seen as an alibi for any other party to walk away. It would simply not be credible to sign the Smith Agreement, to commit to a scheme of further devolution, then to use its imperfections as an excuse to abandon the process of devolution in order to do something radically different instead. Mark McDonald. I'm, I'm interested in the point the member is articulating. Is the member saying that if the fiscal framework uh, results uh, in something which would be detrimental to this Parliament that we should still agree it because that would not be meeting up to the aspirations that we, uh, we signed up to as part of Smith or does he believe that that fiscal framework should be rejected? I, what I said was that the imperfections in the Scotland Bill as currently drafted as it proceeds through Parliament should not be used as an excuse to walk away from the process. But the member raises the fiscal framework and he's right to do so because of course there are parallel processes underway with a view to implementing Smith. One is open and public, the process of seeking to amend the Scotland Bill in the democratic forum of the House of Commons. The other is hidden and behind closed doors, the process of negotiating the fiscal framework to underpin the future sharing of power between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments. Now, that process of negotiation requires goodwill on both sides. It will only succeed if both governments want it to. There is little point in MPs seeking to improve the bill in Parliament if ministers at the same time are unwilling to negotiate in good faith with a view to making the Smith Agreement work. John Swinney has always rightly emphasised the importance of getting that framework right and describing the process as a negotiation, implying that both sides must be willing to compromise and that the end result is unlikely to be perfect from either point of view. So we are calling today for that process to be made more open and transparent so that the people of Scotland and the wider United Kingdom can see what is being said and done in that negotiation on their behalf. It is important that both governments can demonstrate their goodwill in these negotiations so that we can see that both United Kingdom and Scottish Government Ministers are indeed seeking the best way to implement the Smith Agreement rather than pursuing other priorities at the expense of Scottish devolution. Of course, next year's election should not be about the Scotland Bill or a second referendum on independence uh, or constitutional issues alone. 
It should be about the funding and provision of public services in Scotland, what this Parliament should do with the powers we have and those we will acquire to close the attainment gap, address the crisis in the Scottish NHS, restore local accountability of public services. Those are the issues that matter to the people of Scotland. Devolution is a means to address those issues, not an end of itself. But all parties have signed up to the process, and now all parties need to get on and make it happen. Thank you. Can I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate? Deputy First Minister, until five o'clock, please. Presiding officer, I think this has been an outstanding debate this afternoon in Parliament. It's been graced by a number of very thoughtful and substantive contributions from a range of shades of opinion within Parliament, and I think it's enormously helped to express the view of Parliament in relation to the current status of the passage of the Scotland Bill in what is a momentous week for our country in the, uh, as we approach the first anniversary of the referendum last September, which I think all of us, regardless of our perspectives, accept was a triumph of participatory democracy within our country, despite the fact, as uh, Drew Smith fairly said, it led to different opinions being held uh, by people close to us and in our communities and those who we represent, but nonetheless uh, an invigorating democratic process of which we should be proud. Annabel Goldie started her contribution today by being somewhat surprised by my reaction to the publication of the Smith Commission report in November of last year. I don't think she should have been at all surprised by my reaction to the Smith Commission. Uh, the poor soul had to put up with me going on and on about it for what I've often described as 10 of the happiest weeks of my life. And those who were in the Smith Commission room will realise how much of a joke that actually is. Um, but Annabel Goldie also went on to say that some of the reaction of the government and how we handle these issues and some of the things that my colleagues say are in the, the, the sphere of being equated with angels dancing on the heads of a pin. And I think it's wrong to characterise the issues that have been raised by members across the political spectrum in Parliament today as being somehow um, in, in, that, in that trivial way uh, of describing some of these issues because they are, as we've heard in the course of the debate, really very substantial questions that uh, have been raised about the implementation of the Scotland Bill and what it contributes to the process of devolved government in Scotland. Because where I completely disagree with one of the interventions that Mr Johnson made, is that um, you, when we participated in the, um, in the Smith Commission, Linda Fabiani and I, who represented the Scottish National Party, did not go in there and argue for Scottish independence. We accepted unreservedly the result of the referendum. We argued for strengthened powers for the Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom. And the submission that the Scottish National Party made to that process made that point explicitly and accepted the fact that we could not argue for independence through Smith. We had to argue for strength and devolution, and that is precisely what we did. So we have, I think, a reasonable expectation that what actually comes out of that process is a strengthened form of devolution and one that will be implemented. And I accept, and I accepted in the National Museum of Scotland, that Smith rep represented a strengthened and greater degree of powers for the Scottish Parliament, it clearly didn't ex reach my expectations. And I think Drew Smith made that point very fairly in his contribution to the debate into the bargain. Now, one of the key issues of this debate today has been, has the, Smith, the, the Scotland Bill delivered on Smith or has it not? And this is really, and this may come down to the kind of stuff that Annabel Goldie thinks is angels dancing on the head of a pin, but I really do think it is important. Just about um, five hours ago, four and a half hours ago, the Prime Minister said to my colleague Angus Robertson, the Member of Parliament for Money, leader of the SNP group in the House of Commons, you give me a list of the things that were promised and not delivered, then we can have a very reasonable conversation. Until then, it is all bluster from the SNP. You give me a list of the things that were promised and not delivered, then we can have a very reasonable conversation. Well, we've heard today in Parliament a whole host of things that haven't been delivered. And the Devolution for the Powers Committee of this Parliament unanimously has sent a let several letters to the Secretary of State for Scotland, not least of which the letter that was sent by the committee on the 14th of September that set out a range of things that were not promised 
that were promised and not delivered to fulfil the Prime Minister's request. Now, members could quite fairly then say, well, what have we as the Scottish Government been doing about that? Though? What we as the Scottish Government have been doing is that after the publication of the Smith report in November, we offered jointly to author the clauses that would be published by the UK Government in January. And the First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister on November the 14th to do that, and that was not accepted. After the publication of the Smith clauses in January 2015, we offered, we published, the alterations to those clauses that would turn Smith into reality, and the UK Government did not accept them. When the bill was published after the United Kingdom election, we set out on the 8th of June draft amendments that were published of what would make the bill into Smith. Not us trying to, to, to build beyond Smith, but us simply saying, if we make these changes, this will be what we think to be Smith. And the Secretary of State for Scotland on the 8th of June on the Good Morning Scotland programme said this, I am absolutely clear that the Scotland Bill does fulfil in full the recommendations of the Smith Commission and I am happy to have, as it has been described, my feet to the fire. So on the 8th of June, the Secretary of State said the published bill does the business, does it in full. On the 15th of July, in response to my colleague, the Member of Parliament for Linlithgow and Falkirk East, Martin Day, the Secretary of State for Scotland said, it is my intention to make substantive amendments in the House of Commons when the bill comes back on report. So the Secretary of State, by his answer to Mr Martin Day on the 15th of July, clearly is accepting that what he said on Good Morning Scotland on the 8th of June was rubbish. So why did the Prime Minister say what he said to Angus Robertson at 12.15 this afternoon? Because that, if anything, is what can be described as bluster in the House of Commons as a consequence of the Prime Minister's statement. I would love to. Alex Johnson. <laughs> Having listened to the, what the Minister's had to say over the last few minutes, could he tell me quite clearly if what he's trying to do today is set out a negotiating position or is he trying to close that position down? Well, well, I, I, think my, I think my negotiating position has been pretty well publicised. I published, you know, I published the amendments that would have... I, I've just said to the Parliament, <laughs> what we published on the 8th of June was essentially the clauses that we thought would turn Smith into legislation to our satisfaction. That, well, that was a complete and utter revelation of my negotiating position. Nothing left in the cupboard to, cupboard to disclose. That was it. And I would have thought a UK government interested in all the intergovernmental work that Mr Scott quite understandably always lectures me about the importance of intergovernmental work being done properly and fully, that would have said it all and we could have just settled on that. Now, to address some of the other issues that have been raised in the debate, in the fiscal framework, um, Mr Scott, uh, to come back to Mr Scott's point, talked about how he couldn't conceive of the Scottish Government voting down additional powers because of the context of the fiscal framework. And what I would say to Mr Scott is that Parliament has to understand the government's position, that we see the fiscal framework and the bill as one in the same thing. There is no point in having the powers if we don't have the fiscal framework that now allows us to exercise them without prejudice to the interests of Scotland. And on Claire Baker's point, where Claire Baker made a number of very fair and reasonable points about the transparency of the process. I've gone to the Finance Committee now, I think, on two occasions about the fiscal framework, and I've set out a lot of the government's thinking in, uh, on the issues that we have to provide. I've also said to the, the Finance Committee, I cannot see how I can provide a running commentary on the issues that have been discussed within the, um, the, the, the Joint Exchequer Committee, of which she quite correctly says I am the Joint Chair. But I can assure her that the there will be a report published after each meeting of the Joint Exchequer Committee, and that has happened on the occasions that it is met. And secondly, that there will, of course, be the ability to have full consideration and analysis of the fiscal framework that emerges from those discussions by Parliament before we move to any acceptance of the Scotland Bill. And I will only come to Parliament and recommend the acceptance of a fiscal framework if I believe that to be fair in the interests of the people of Scotland and consistent with what was envisaged by the Smith Commission in its report. Now, Malcolm Chisholm 
made, I thought, a couple of very substantial points about some of the elements of the Scotland Bill which are more about micromanagement than they are about devolution. And Rob Gibson made the same points in relation to the Crown Estate, and we should avoid that at our peril. Devolution is about giving power to the Parliament to exercise that power, not to stipulate how powers should be used. Finally, Drew Smith made, I thought, uh, I'm always weary about praising Labour members because I feel it doesn't do them any good internally, <laughs> but if Drew Smith forgives me, I thought he made a, a really substantial contribution to the debate today about how we have to, how there is an opportunity to create broader agreement about the further stages that can be made in empowering this Parliament uh, by dialogue and discussion uh, and debate. And that has been helped by the debate today. I think the Smith Commission would have been helped by that process to a greater extent. And I undoubtedly think the, the Scotland Bill would be strengthened if the UK Government would respond positively to the substantive and dispassionate contribution that has been made, no least by the Devolution Powers Committee, but also by the Scottish Parliament into the bargain. Um, finally, Linda Fabiani, uh, made a key point in this whole debate, which is about the need for this entire package to be cohesive. It must hang together. It must enable us to exercise the type of welfare responsibilities and imagination that Mr McMahon talked about, but also give us the ability to create the stronger economy to fund those provisions as a consequence. And that is the bit that we think is substantially uh, lacking in the contents of the Smith Commission Agreement. And by its nature, if it's absent from the Smith Commission Agreement, it will be absent from the Scotland Bill into the bargain. That is what we must remedy. Mr Macdonald may have given us the clue. There was a Scotland Act 1998, a Scotland Act 2012, a Scotland Act 2015. Who knows? There might need to be another Scotland Act into the bargain. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future, democracy and devolution. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14255. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 14255. Formally moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 14255, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. <coughs> there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 14252.2, in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 14252, in the name of John Swinney, on Scotland's future, democracy and devolution be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14252.2 in the name of Clear Baker is as follows. Yes, 43. No, 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 14252.1 in the name of Annabel Goldie, which seeks to amend motion number 14252 in the name of John Swinney. On Scotland's future, democracy and devolution be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14252.1 
In the name of Annabel Goldie is as follows. Yes, 13. No, 73. There were 32 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 14252 in the name of John Swinney. On Scotland's future, democracy and devolution be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 14252 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 105. No, 13. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.